with you at this Alder hearing on the anti counterfeiting trade agreement. We will not do long introductory remarks because basically we have the pleasure to have the experts among us, uh, which allows us uh, to, to listen and learn also because um, basically being initiators doesn't mean that you're an expert on this one. That's why I'm very, very happy that we have uh, Dr. Michael Geis here from the University of Ottawa, uh, Faculty of Law, very well known probably from the internet and those who follow blogs and the issue around ACTA. Um, he has been considered one of the experts, if not the expert on ACTA. But uh, I'm very sure that uh, Mr. Luc Devine, to his right also, who is uh, the Commission's head negotiator, if that is rightly said, uh, on the ACTA agreement, is probably equally somebody you could call the expert on ACTA. So uh, we have two of the experts around, and I'm very, very looking forward to their interventions. Um, then I am very happy to welcome to my left Mr. Stefan Kravchik from um, eBay, a company most of you might know, but not because of that invited, um, but invited because um, having an online trade platform dealing with goods, you also have to avoid that what is traded on your platform is counterfeited because people only want to spend their money for original goods. To his left, you will find Malcolm Hutti from EuroISPA. It's a European Internet Service Providers Association, representing more than, if I got it right, 18,000? 1,800, okay, so not 18,000. 1,800 uh, companies dealing with these issues. And uh, to my far right, Angelina Gross of the European Parliament's Legal Service, uh, which will give us some in light in terms of how the procedure goes, what is the legal background, how is Parliament involved, a lot of things after the Lisbon Treaty, we, as much as you, will have to learn and find out how it goes. Um, as I said, since I am not the expert on this issue, uh, I won't go any deeper, but I'm sure that there are a couple of questions you might have we will find answered. I will be um, very strict on the time because we have limited time and um, it will be more about your questions and the presentations of the guests we have. But I'm also very happy to hand over to Marietje Schake, who is a colleague of mine in the ALDE group. I also see, among others, Sophie Infeld from our group, uh, Françoise Castex, uh, Mrs. Eva Lichtenberger. I hope I didn't forget any other, oh yes, Renate Viva, Natalie Griesbeck, a lot of colleagues <laughs> basically around from, from, our, from our group and um, I am uh, very happy to see that also parliamentarians are interested in these issues because in the end we will be the ones who will have to decide about this too. But without further delay, I would like to hand over to my colleague Marietje Schake. Thank you very much, Alexander, and uh, uh, welcome to all the members of the European Parliament and former member of the European Parliament. Uh, we have a very distinguished and diverse audience here today in the room, so it's going to be a very exciting exchange of views and a, and a debate, but we also have an audience at home because this entire meeting is web-streamed live from this room. So welcome to all the people who are watching. Uh, this hearing at their computers at home. Um, we're very honored to have the distinguished experts here uh, in our panel. They will share some of their ideas and um, uh, we look forward to exchanging with you on the basis of that. There are a lot of uh, opinions but also a lot of questions out there when it comes to ACTA. Uh, of course, some of, the, some of the negotiation documents have been leaked, but that is not exactly uh, our idea of how democratic oversight and transparency should be organized. So uh, the EP, <coughs> the European Parliament, has spoken out for more transparency on this issue. And we're also waiting for the political stance of other important players, such as the United States, in this whole uh, agreement, which might uh, happen as soon as next week. But uh, the ALDE group will continue to focus on increased transparency in the process of uh, getting insight into this uh, treaty which deals with counterfeit goods on the one hand, but this afternoon we will mainly focus on the impact it could possibly have 
uh, on the use of internet and the free access to information. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, hand the floor to the first distinguished guest we have, Dr. Geis. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much. And, and it's, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to, to come and speak and to frankly see such a, so many people come out to talk about ACTA. I think for a lot of us, it's pretty gratifying to, to recognize that the issue has generated such increasing amount of attention. I think for a while, there was real concern that this issue would, would escalate to the point that we could get this no, these number of people out to talk about um, a treaty. So what I wanted to do today was, as I mentioned to a few people this morning, answer the question that I get, Frank, probably most frequently, certainly when I get press requests about this, frankly, even sometimes from my own children, when they ask, why am I talking about this ACTA treaty yet again? What's the big deal? Why is there a concern? Uh, and indeed, I think many people, when they have focused on this issue, have, have tried to suggest that there's really nothing here to be all that concerned about, move along. Uh, this is sort of par for the course, and that the kind of concern and attention that the issue has generated uh, is far beyond what ACTA would actually merit. Uh, and I guess what I want to do in many respects is try to make the case that I think the concern is justified, uh, and that really merits and mandates some significant change in terms of, of the process, and indeed I would argue even with respect to the text. Two caveats, though, before I get going. I think it's critical to first recognize that those that are concerned with ACTA are not pro-counterfeiting or anti-copyright. Now, it seems to me that this has at times been a very easy smear to make, those that suggest that there are problems with, with ACTA are somehow <laughs> against copyright, against uh, potential reforms for copyright, and are somehow pro-counterfeiting. This is just simply not the case. I mean, I don't know anybody who is legitimately in favor of counterfeiting, and as someone with three kids, I too worry about uh, health and safety issues with respect to counterfeiting. And frankly, if ACTA was designed to deal directly with those issues, was the kind of targeted, narrowly defined treaty, I don't think we would have a room full of people here to talk about it, and I don't think it would generate the kind of interest that it has. I also think, candidly, that those that are supportive of ACTA have to do more to make the case that ACTA is indeed necessary. Uh, in many ways, given that we've been talking about this now for a couple of years, the onus has shifted to those who are concerned about ACTA to make the case that it isn't necessary. I don't think that that's actually where the onus lies, and I think it requires more than industry-backed studies that suffer from significant methodological purposes or method methodology as the basis for suggesting there's a problem. That's not to suggest that there isn't a problem with counterfeiting, but as even as the OECD has recognized, there are real issues in terms of identifying the scope of the problem and even more whether or not the current legal rules that we have in place are somehow insufficient to deal with some of those problems. And I think there's a bit of a, a requirement there as, as we move along with this process. With those caveats out of the way, I want to make the case with respect to three things about why at least I'm concerned with ACTA and I think many others ought to be as well. The first has to do with transparency, no big surprise. Second has to do with the substance of the treaty based on, on the leaks that are now widely available. And then thirdly, and perhaps even most importantly, some of the long-term implications that I think come out of this ACTA process. Let's start then first with the issue of transparency. I think it's essential to recognize that ACTA is not the norm. Now, I know that there are people out there who would argue that this is just another trade agreement and that trade agreements are traditionally conducted in secret. There's nothing to see here. Move along. This is no different than dozens of other treaties that have come before it. I'm here to say that I don't believe that is the case. In fact, I don't think anybody can credibly read the text of ACTA and conclude that this is anything other than an intellectual property agreement not a trade agreement. And it's fine that you can call it the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. At its heart, it is not about counterfeiting. It's about copyright. And it is not a trade agreement. It is an IP agreement. And if we compare the level of transparency that has traditionally occurred with respect to international negotiations around intellectual property, whether at WIPO or at UNESCO or at UNCTAD, they are all far more transparent than what we have seen here to date. And so you can't say that this is the way it's always been with respect to trade when we're not, I would argue, dealing with 
a traditional trade agreement. This is an IP agreement, full stop. And IP agreements, if we take a look at WIPO as sort of the, the paradigm example, it is, after all, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Think of things like the Internet treaties conducted and negotiated back in the mid-90s. Texts were made more readily available. We look at WIPO today. Groups are invited to, to be at the General Assembly, to be at all the various events. It is conducted in a much more open and transparent manner than what we see with ACTA today. Note as well that ACTA is not strictly about enforcement. So part of that other corollary there as well, it's not about substance, it's strictly about enforcement. I'll come to some of the substantive concerns in a few minutes, uh, but I think that again, you can't read the text as it's, as it's publicly available. Indeed, you can't even review the summaries that the governments themselves have made available. And I think credibly conclude that this is strictly about enforcement without touching on the substance of intellectual property. I mean, there's clearly provisions in there that deal with those issues. Now, from a transparency perspective, I think in some respects the, the news is, is somewhat good because we have seen a pretty dramatic shift in the years from when ACTA was first being hatched as an idea to when it was publicly announced to where we stand today, just days from the next negotiating round in New Zealand, in terms of the level of openness. It's not nearly open enough, but it certainly has changed. Unsurprisingly, the early discussions back even before the, the public announcement that ACTA was to be negotiated were conducted in secret. I don't think that's a surprise. When this was first announced in October 2007, it was, things were, con were quite secret. During the, the meetings in 2008 in Geneva and then in Washington, Paris and Tokyo, these things were relatively secret as well. Indeed, if I think back to the very first meeting in Geneva, the location itself was held in secret. There was little in the way of providing meeting, agenda, uh, the summary, well, the summary that, that's released afterwards has remained pretty much unchanged. It's three paragraphs, and we could probably write the New Zealand one now um, if we wanted, because it just doesn't provide very much information. But in 2008, there was almost none of that even. Last year, things got a little better with brief summaries that effectively uh, confirmed what had already been leaked on the Internet, uh, the meeting agenda being made available, and then the infamous insiders in the United States, I think of the 41 or 42 people that were invited to sign a non-disclosure agreement that gave them brief access to the Internet chapter within ACTA. So we've seen a little bit, but I think it's really only been in the last few months that this issue has escalated, thanks in many respects to what we've seen here in Europe, uh, where virtually all countries, it would appear, are now supportive of transparency for a long while, as I think many know. The approach was to blame, to say that I'm in favor of transparency, but someone else is to blame. Uh, a recent leak sort of identified who is to blame, identified the specific European countries as well as Singapore, South Korea and the United States as being uh, seemingly the barriers towards transparency and one would hope that at the meeting that takes place next week, those countries are seen as the outliers, now it's just three because Europe has I think come on board, are seen as the outliers and are called to justify the, on, the ongoing approach with respect to the secrecy. At this point in time, they are been identified, they are in the clear minority, and I don't think, given that this treaty is anyway out there, that remaining secret makes any kind of sense. I should note that the mere fact that the treaty is accessible to anyone with access to the Internet is not good enough. It's not enough to, to call, ask people to rely on leaked documents when we are dealing with a democratic countries that are seeking to negotiate a treaty. The treaty itself must be formally made available. I believe the draft text must formally be made available to the public, which will both enable people involved in the process to provide more candid responses and answers with, what, with respect to what takes place, as opposed to the kind of shield, in a sense, that a leaked document provides where it's difficult to confirm or deny documents or provisions that are found in a leaked document. Now, the transparency discussion is focused primarily on, on this issue of making the draft text available. I would argue that I think we ought to be expecting better of our own governments when it comes to the kind of information they provide, even about ACTA itself. I think, frankly, some of the statements that have been made from any number of governments have been, at best, somewhat misleading. So, for example, on the issue of three strikes, there have been claims that there is no mandatory three strikes in ACTA. Anyone who's seen the draft text knows that that's true. It's not mandatory. Yet it's quite clearly included as an example of the kind of policy that an ISP might put into place. 
and, to, and to, to rest your hat, in a sense, on this issue of mandatory versus not mandatory, I think misleads many people. So too claims that there's been no discussion of three strikes, which we've heard in the past. There clearly has been. It's in a footnote, and it was, it's in, been in summary documents and other leaked documents that have been available now for months, dating back to last fall. Even some of the statements in the public documents, the summaries themselves, I don't think tell the full story. So claims that we are dealing solely with enforcement rather than substance. I'm sorry, but that's not true. There are provisions there that deal with things like anti-circumvention legislation, with rights management information, with dealing with labels that are seen as counterfeiting. These are substantive provisions that would require substantive change and are not dealing solely with enforcement. So too the claims that act to deal solely with commercial cases of counterfeiting. Again, not true. Statutory damages provisions, say, in the United States have been used now in the case of file-sharing lawsuits more than 30,000 times, actually just in this new round, a private, privately run one with more than 20,000 lawsuits uh, in one instance against people alleged to have used BitTorrent to download movies. And in every instance, we are dealing with what I think is clearly non-commercial activity. I'm not, we can debate whether the harm of it, but it's clearly non-commercial. And yet statutory damages come to the fore, creating the prospect of commercial level liability. Even with the de minimis provision, the infamous provision that, of which there are several, several proposals currently on the table to deal in effect with the rumors of iPod searching border guards. There we've got both Rights holders expressing concern about the mere presence of this kind of provision, arguing that it would send the wrong message in an anti-counterfeiting treaty to say that, well, at the same time, we'll allow people to have a limited amount of counterfeit product. But even more, the language that we've seen within the various proposals talk solely trying to carve out commercial versus non-commercial, yet many people who cross borders with things like this, a personal computer, are treated as if this is a commercial piece of equipment which can also be subject to search. And so questions both as to the ongoing possibility of a presence of a de minimis provision, so two concerns about whether or not this actually provides the effective carve out that some believe it's meant to be. So transparency, an ongoing problem that needs to be addressed, not just with, with respect to the text, but indeed as well with respect to the kind of information that is being provided by our officials, both in my country and elsewhere. Second big concern that I have is with the substance. And candidly, eventually, we are going to get past the transparency issue. Perhaps it will happen next week. Perhaps it happens in Geneva in early June, when I believe the next round is scheduled to take place. At some point in time, uh, this issue will be passed. And at that point in time, we're going to have to start talking about the substance. And I think from a substantive perspective, there are real concerns about what is being discussed. To give you a number of examples, I point to the anti-circumvention provisions. These are the provisions that are found in the WIPO Internet Treaties negotiated back in the mid-1990s. If we go back to that point in time, it was very difficult. Those seeking to negotiate those treaties were unable to achieve consensus on language that ultimately made its way into the U.S. copyright law under the DMCA. And so more broad liberal language was adopted. That was where they were able to achieve consensus. ACTA, in many, from my perspective, represents a renegotiation of those treaties, taking the language that the U.S. and others were unable to achieve during the negotiations of the WIPO Internet Treaties in the mid-90s and inserting them now within ACTA. Yes, that language has been adopted in a number of places, including within Europe and in the United States, but there are other countries, including New Zealand and Canada, and many participants who are not yet part of ACTA, nor signatories or people who have... Uh, have implemented the WIPO Internet Treaties who have not taken that approach. And that renegotiation of these treaties just less than 15 years later I think is highly problematic. So too issues around notice and takedown, again found in some countries but not found in all countries. And in fact even within that ACTA process not found within all countries. Some countries rejecting it not because they don't want an, an effective approach to deal with the issue of, of infringement on system, on intermediaries, but precisely because they want to deal effectively with, those, with, with infringement that takes place, rejecting the notice and takedown approach, adopting things like notice and notice and other sorts of approaches that are out there, ACTA at least as currently conceives would mandate a notice and takedown approach. Anti-camp courting provisions, provisions that are found in a number of countries, including my own in Canada, but is now currently, from what we can tell, opposed in some places, including New Zealand, Australia, and Switzerland, in part because those countries haven't adopted that yet. Clear, substantive provisions being discussed there. 
the scope of the treaty. I mean, if anything tells us that there is still some distance between concluding this treaty uh, and where we are today, it's the fact that even the scope, whether we are going to stick with just copyright and trademark or expand, extend to patent and other IP-related rights, that is still up in the air, and the implications of extending it broadly to all forms of IP or even just the inclusive in inclusion of patents, I think would raise huge numbers of issues. There are some other substantive concerns that come up. I referenced earlier statutory damages, which the experience to date in countries that do have statutory damages, the United States, Canada, among them, is that, not, is that yes, they have some uses in commercial context, but the place where they have been used the most, and I think there's, it's undisputed at this point in time, is in non-commercial context. I mean, we've had more lawsuits, certainly in the United States, over the last five years involving non-commercial cases of infringement where statutory damages are used as the mechanism to in many ways persuade or coerce a settlement into the thousands of dollars based on potential liability that could run into the millions of dollars, which is precisely what statutory damages is all about, and yet that's what we see here in this provision. We see from a criminal provision perspective, we see language that talks about inciting, aiding, and abetting, quoting from the text, at least in cases of willful trademark, counterfeiting, and copyright or related rights, piracy on a commercial scale. I mean, that language, that inciting, aiding, and abetting language from a cr criminal perspective, something not found in many countries, uh, and yet w would require uh, that escalation, of, uh, the escalation of, of that level of liability. I've already talked about the de minimis provision and the prospect that commuter, c computer searches still could be captured, even with the proposals that are currently on the table. Broadly speaking, there is, it's important from a substantive perspective, I think, to recognize that unlike many other treaties and ma unlike many domestic laws that deal with intellectual property, which recognize that there is a balance to be achieved between the interests of rights holders on the one hand and users on the other, that balance is missing almost completely from X. And so the balancing provisions that one finds in international documents, whether in trips or elsewhere, or even basic notions of fair use or fair dealing, are nowhere to be found. We're waiting for the leak that contains references to fair use or fair dealing, and I fear that we're going to wait a very long time. And so that balance that we find exists in many other documents simply isn't there. A couple of other examples, the injunct injunctive powers that we find within ACTA. Each party, quoting again from the text, shall ensure judicial authorities may issue against the infringer an injunction aimed at prohibiting the continuation of the infringement. KEI, Knowledge Ecology International, has a terrific post that identifies the many instances, at least under U.S. law, where there are exceptions to that injunctive approach, recognizing that in injunctions are not always appropriate in certain copyright, patent, and trademark instances. I'd also point to the institutional related concerns. ACTA does not stop when ACTA is agreed to. We're talking about more than just an IP agreement or a trade agreement or whatever, however we want to characterize this agreement. Now, I realize that there are those that have argued that the institutional issues ought not to be discussed until a treaty is concluded. I believe that includes the Europeans, and it's my own government in Canada that I believe drafted this initial draft text on an institutional structure. But if we take a look at what we find there, whether it's the Oversight Council that would be created as part of an ACTA, a secretariat, the prospect of new observers and entrants, dispute resolution mechanisms, although no one is quite clear yet what that would mean, and even more, technical assistance. All of this, if this sounds familiar, this sounds a lot like what WIPO does today. And yet this is all, at least for the moment, seemingly envisioned as part of an ACTA structure. It's been at least put forward, if not necessarily agreed to by all. And so the concerns for many is that this is creating more than just a new way of negotiating. It is also creating an entirely new structure around intellectual property. And finally, on the substantive side, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least talk about three strikes slash graduated response, the issue that has, of course, attracted a great deal of attention. And in some ways, I think, it's confusion as to the scope that things like graduated response are included. Now, if we take a look at the text, what the US, current U.S. proposal talks about is that it conditions, it, this all comes about in provisions dealing with safe harbors. And so let's recognize that intermediaries like ISPs have long said that it is essential for them to be able to conduct their business in an effective and efficient fashion, that there is a safe harbor enacted into a statute that allows them to conduct their bid, know what their obligations are, know, know what their responsibilities are at the same time. 
Now, ACTA includes specific language talking about what those requirements would be to qualify for a safe harbor, and one of the conditions condition the application of the provision adopting and reasonably implementing a policy, and there is a footnote attached to the word policy, to address the unauthorized storage or transmission of materials protected by copyright or related rights. Now, there is, of course, there no reference to three strikes or graduated response, which is why some may say there is no graduated or three strikes response within the actual ACTA text. But if one read goes down to the footnote, footnote itself includes the following. An example of such a policy, being an ISP policy, is providing for the termination in appropriate circumstances of subscriptions and or accounts on the service provider system or network of repeat infringers. Now that sounds an awful lot like, awful lot to me, like graduated response or three strikes. It doesn't say it happens, has to happen in three times. It talks about repeat infringers and termination in appropriate circumstances. Now I recognize that this is within a footnote and I recognize as well that it is provided as a model or an example of a policy that an ISP might have. But let's also recognize that it is the only example that has been provided. There are no other illustrations that are out there about appropriate policies that are put into place. Now this is just the US proposal according to the leak. There are, there's a European proposal, there's a Japanese proposal as well. I think it's fair to say that based at least on the US text, which was of course the first that leaked that generated much of the initial discussion around this issue and based on the fact that it continues to be there, there is if not a mandatory, it's not a mandatory requirement, a clear movement in that direction. And I think that raises huge amounts of concerns. And indeed, I would argue one need only look at the experience with respect to anti-circumvention legislation that I mentioned a moment ago, where in the mid-90s, you can't get consent, unable to achieve consensus at WIPO on any circumvention provisions that look like the DMCA, and so broader, more illustrative language is used. You then get the more specific, granular implementation within the DMCA. And fast forward about 10 years later, and we're now told that is the standard and it looks to be found in ACTA. I think there are many who are concerned that we may see the same thing happen here again where this is a requirement to have a policy. The Japanese have, have said they don't even have a policy requirement within their legislation. This now requires a policy. It identifies this as the policy, termination of, repeat inf of allegedly repeat infringers. And we can easily, I think, envision a time two years from now, five years from now, where this is now seen as the standard and pressure builds in country after country to meet that same standard. We've seen exactly this kind of scenario play out before. Now finally, so I've talked about substance, talked about transparency, let me spend a couple of minutes and with this I'll wrap up on long-term implications. Because in many ways much of the concern around ACTA involves not just this particular treaty but implications that extend beyond just the substance. First off, concerns around the shift away from multilateral open negotiations. If anything, right, we are at a time when we ought to be embracing more multilateralism and more openness with respect to negotiations, and ACTA moves us precisely in the opposite direction. Indeed, one might well argue that that is indeed the intent, that it is sometimes more challenging to achieve consensus in a closed environment, and so let's move to this other approach, which might be seen as a country club style approach where a small group of people make the rules and, and aren't bound by some of the other conventions that we find uh, typically within multilateral institutional international negotiations. There are, of course, and we started to see talk of this, constitutional related issues. One of the, the striking things that we've seen, both with, seen with respect to ACTA, are there consistent claims that everybody says their laws aren't going to change, but somebody else's laws are going to change. So we hear it in the United States, we hear it here in Europe, we hear it in Australia. Our laws don't need to change, somebody else's laws need to change. Well, first, of course, that begs the question, what is the point of all of this if nobody's laws are going to change? But more, more to the point, if one reads the text, it is clear that this just is simply not the case. Frankly, everybody's law is going to have to change because there are differences in implementation with respect to many of these issues in many different countries. And so resting, as they do in the United States, on an executive agreement with the notion that there is no need for approval because there is no substantive change simply can't continue to stand. And Professors Lessig and Goldsmith in an op-ed in the Washington Post last week made the case that there were serious constitutional concerns. I take a look at what we've seen here in Europe with respect to the Lisbon Treaty and the importance of involving the European Parliament and I think their voice on this issue is as much about that constitutional framework in terms of treaty negotiation as it is about the substance of ACTA as well. 
I point to the fact that ACTA now sidelines a number of critical international copyright related issues. Things like limitations and exceptions work that we've seen at WIPO, the Treaty for the Blind that is ongoing, the development agenda that is ongoing at WIPO. All of these things effectively sidelined or put into a state of gridlock by virtue of the fact that many of the countries that are essential to participate in that discussion have now taken their ball and gone to play elsewhere within the ACTA context and may have less incentive to negotiate and participate on some of those issues. There are, as I'm sure many people know, serious privacy-related issues. I thought that the opinion piece that came out of the European Data Protection Supervisor, Hugh Stinks, expressing serious concern about what this, pri what this means from a privacy perspective, both around three strikes, as well as with respect to cross-border cross -border enforcement, are very serious issues, well argued um, by Commissioner Hughes thinks, and we have to, I think, is a wake-up call for those in the privacy community of the implications from an act. And the last view, and with this I'll conclude, I've argued in a number of pieces that I do think, and I alluded to this earlier, that this ultimately may well undermine WIPO as well as the WIPO development agenda. In some ways we have seen this before, where if we go back a decade or two, UNESCO was largely seen as the key fora for much of this discussion. A number of countries grew tired of UNESCO and the ability to achieve consensus. We got told that you just couldn't advance our issues. And so people moved on to WIPO where it was seen as an easier place uh, to do business. In recent years, a number of countries have become more active within WIPO, pursuing the development agenda, pursuing the limitations and exceptions related is issues, a number of different issues. And I fear that that initiative, as well as the progress that's been made within WIPO with respect to openness and transparency, are deeply undermined by ACTA where the ability to negotiate and continue to pursue that mandate will be lost. This coming at a time when ACTA has, we should be clear, ACTA has an enforcement committee that could be seen as having the ability to deal with precisely the same issues that we're seeking to deal with in ACTA. I have concerns certainly as someone coming from Canada that ACTA at some point in time, once concluded, becomes a pressure point for not just those within ACTA but elsewhere. Read the special 301 report on an annual basis or even the national trade estimates, taking a look at trade barriers that came out from the USTR last week. Country after country after country are cited for all sorts of things, some of which are found in international law, other of which are strictly business issues, and it seems to me very clear that at some point in time ACTA will be described as a standard in those countries that don't meet that standard, the argument will be uh, have failed to effectively address these issues and thus uh, get cited in something like a USTR Special 301. And finally, with this I'll conclude, the irony of all of this is that if you were serious about counterfeiting, this treaty doesn't do the job, right? I mean, it is, as I've described on a number of occasions in the past, a counterfeiting agreement without the counterfeiters. And so we've got negotiating parties who say, most of which say they don't need any domestic change within their laws, by almost any review, are not the source of any significant amount of counterfeit product, particularly when we're talking about health and safety related issues. And yet all the countries that are identified consistently as the primary sources of this product, who presumably are the very countries who we'd want to have at the table, are expressly not at the table. And so if we're going to deal seriously with counterfeiting, and I say as many, I think, that we ought to be dealing seriously with issues around health and safety, then we have to recognize that ACTA, even by design, is not designed to deal with this in effective fashion. If you were serious about it, what you would do is it would ensure that you brought to the table the various other countries who are seen as a concern, not say these countries are barriers in order for us to get some sort of agreement and explicitly exclude them from the very outset. And so therefore, I am concerned, and I think frankly we all ought to be concerned, and with that I'll stop. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. This was, at least for me until now, one of the most comprehensive uh, reflections on this agreement. We have now time for questions and answers from the floor, so feel free if you have any questions concerning the introduction given by Mr. Geist. Please. 
Thank you very much, Professor Geist, for your presentation. My question will be very direct. You, you, you mentioned a number of aspects, but you didn't actually uh, point out what is behind all this. Why is all this agreement being negotiated with another name? Yes, it's not under counterfeiting. So, but what is behind all this? And who are the countries who are missing, actually, at this negotiation? Thank you. Well, as for the why, uh, I mean, anyone, we can all speculate as to why this is being negotiated. I think that part of this is genuinely an attempt to deal with some counterfeit-related issues. But if we take a look at the substance of the treaty, if we take a look at the process of the treaty, I think the why has to do with a recognition a number of years ago that intellectual property involved more than just an enforcement agenda, more than just the enforcement agenda we see reflected within ACTA. It involves issues around things like development, around limitations and exceptions, around a number of different issues, and that including, as part of an IP agenda, both of those was proving challenging for those that were much more focused on the enforcement side, and so saw this as a golden opportunity, a mechanism in effect, to try to move forward on the enforcement part of the equation without necessarily having to deal with all the rest of it. And couching this as counterfeiting proved to be a effect, very effective, certainly effective way of characterizing what's taking place. It's been striking. I was talking with someone earlier today in Canada. We had a consultation on, on, on ACTA last year. And whenever you go to these meetings, one of the very first things that gets talked about are health and safety related issues. And so there were members in Canada from the Department of Foreign Affairs, from Industry Canada, from Canadian Heritage, from Public Safety, uh, and a number of the groups representing access to medicines asked, where is the per person from the Ministry of Health? After all, you opened your very first sentence, talked about health-related issues, and there was nobody there. It was a sort of, I thought, a telling omission in terms of who was at that table. Health and safety is something we're all concerned with, and so it is a very effective tool to move forward on issues like anti-cam courting, uh, three strikes, and issues that frankly have nothing to do with that. As for who's not at the table that ought to be, we need only look at the countries that are so often targeted or named as, prob as countries that are seen as sources of this issue, whether we're talking about China or in Indonesia or Pakistan, or think about some of the BRIC countries like Brazil or India. These are countries that are increasingly engaged on intellectual property, intellectual property policy, and their exclusion, I think, is, is striking and highlights the fact that we're talking about a treaty that in some ways is designed to fail if, we, if, if the real goal is one to deal with counterfeit-related issues. Thank you very much. Erika. Erika Mann, Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, I think you made a pretty good um, explanation and um, I remember well I was a member to the European Parliament when the whole debate started about ACTA that actually the main goal was actually to negotiate with the countries you mentioned to pull the others which are more complicated and critical like China and India and Brazil the ones you mentioned to pull them along so to make first a deal with the ones which are on board now and then to continue the discussion and then the long-term goal of course is to have all of the developing countries and everyone else included. Now, I agree with you. I think this is something which is not going to work out. And I think it's, um, I mean, just look into the Google and China case. Uh, I mean, China is not going to change its policy like all the other countries because of this agreement. Quite the opposite. It opens the front, which makes it much more complicated for all the other ones which bind their hand by this agreement. But I have one question because I, what I hear that you would prefer that the agreement is negotiated uh, within the WIPO agreement. Could you imagine, actually, um, that maybe another uh, way could be to leave it at the WTO, or actually to move it? It's not in WTO right now, but to do it as a TRIPS agreement, because there we have enforcement rules, we have dispute settlement agreement, we have all the countries involved from the very beginning. <coughs> Wouldn't this be something you would exclude automatically? Uh, because it is an IPR agreement, is this the argument? But I would say if you would leave out certain parts, which you, I agree with you, which rightly should be only negotiated in WIPO, but if you leave the, leave the good parts, then maybe the TRIPS in, environment could work as well. Just a question to you. Thank you. So I'll answer that, but I also want to note that when you talk about, when we talk about pulling along other countries, let's recognize what 
pulling along other countries actually means. What it means is pressuring those countries, whether by way of bilateral trade agreements or other sorts of, other sorts of mechanisms to say that you've got to agree to these standards, uh, otherwise we're not dealing on some of these other issues. That's what pulling along is. Note as well that this is in many respects seen as a coalition of the willing, the countries that are all seen to be uh, on side. And what is striking when you take a look at the draft text is that I think we can all agree that amongst those countries, everybody has as their goal to deal with counterfeiting effectively. Indeed, I would argue to deal with infringement of IPRs effectively. But we don't all take precisely the same road to get there. One of the challenges, and I think it's, it's evident when you take a look at the text, is that ACTA seeks to be so, be so granular, so specific in approach, unlike most other higher level international instruments that set as a goal what is designed to happen, but don't get into that granularity, that it be quickly becomes evident that it's very difficult to achieve even consensus among people who agree that this is a problem that we ought to be dealing with. Now, as for the appropriate fora, I know that We've heard that what the WTO is seen as a non-starter, that we can't, I saw a couple of weeks ago, we were told, can't even put it on the agenda at the WTO. Uh, and if indeed that is the case, then I suppose that represents a problem. But it what I think, case. it is, so there we go. So, so here you hear here why WTO isn't the place that we can do this. I would say that whether it is the WTO or WIPO, there are certain things that we see today within international fora that are so strikingly absent from ACTA that it tells us precisely what is missing from that ACTA process. It's from what some might see, it's from everything to, of language, the ACTA treaty saying English is the, is, is the official language of ACTA. That's not something that, that plays in almost any other international fora, to the more openness approach that we see on many other things when these talks are happening. And I think that's what many people are saying we desperately need within this ACTA process. Not necessarily that it's about WIPO or WTO or UNESCO or whatever, or UNCTAD, it doesn't really matter what the, what the fora is. I, think, well, I personally think WIPO is most, the most clearly obvious fora for this. It's about imbuing these kinds of discussions with the basic kinds of democratic notions, openness and transparency that increasingly are part of that multilateral system, but I think are strikingly absent from ACTA. Can, can I ask a question? I ask you a question because if you agree and well there's nothing to agree disagree it's just the, the reality that enforcement has become a taboo topic in WTO TRIPS agreement despite the very uh, purpose of TRIPS agreement to monitor its functioning and since it is the same membership in WTO and WIPO why would the country who could refuse to have enforcement on the agenda in WTO would accept to have it in WIPO or even better to work on something better I guess my response would be that if we take a look at the fact that A, WIPO has an enforcement committee which is active, and B, we have, so we have some of those, you, might have, you may have missed some of that because the, the Korea negotiations were taking place precisely the same week, but nevertheless, uh, that committee does function. Uh, and more than that, uh, the reality is that many of the countries who are involved that, that you would say are, are seen as not moving forward on these issues now come to the WIPO process with some very specific goals of their own. So that when they talk about things like access to medicines or a treaty for the blind or certain issues on limitations and exceptions, they come with a goal not of trying to muck up the system and stop progress with respect to IP as broadly defined as more than just enforcement. They come to WIPO with their issues, uh, a core part of what they want to see happen. And what's happening is that uh, if you, I, I think that the way to achieve uh, so on the enforcement side is actually to put both of those issues more clearly on the table. Move, taking it off the table and going to ACTA undermines both the ability to deal with those issues and raises the kinds of concerns that I've talked about. Very good to see that you two are warming up. Um, we, also, we also have a further request for the floor, Sophie Infeld and then David Hammerstein. If there's anyone else asking for the floor in this round, please indicate now because afterwards then I would hand over to Mr. Devigne. Doesn't seem so. Sophie, please. Yes, thank you, Alexander. And I, I, I will put my question to both speakers because I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, the, the reply from both. I, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your exhaustive list of um, uh, concerns with ACTA. I think there is one small one that you could add, and that's the one of function creep. Um, but I think the, the key issue here is indeed transparency, and I very much agree with you that um, people have a right to know 
citizens have a right to know and they shouldn't have to rely on leaked documents. And I know, and I'm looking at the Commission, that, you know, sometimes democracy is a bummer, you know, it gets in the way of smooth running of the business, but we do live in a democracy, or at least we, we like to believe that. Now, we do have rules in the European Union on public access to documents. Uh, and I noticed that there is a pattern here. It's not just ACTA. It's in many international negotiations. Every time um, the argument of uh, international relations is invoked as a reason for not disclosing documents. And I wonder if, and, and that means that it overrules our own rules on transparency. And I wonder if uh, the Commission actually has a right to do that. I think morally it doesn't. This non-disclosure clause should not have been signed. Uh, and I hope it will never be signed again. But I wonder if legally, because I'm not a lawyer, I know Alexander is, if legally the Commission has a right to simply sign away the rights of European citizens to know what's going on. And finally, and I'll conclude on this, I don't buy the argument that international negotiations always take place in secret. They don't. I, I think that you gave a couple of examples. It was just last week they were, were negotiating uh, uh, CITES on, on uh, pr protected species. Uh, they've been negotiating about the environment. That hardly took place in secret. I really don't see why these things have to take place in secret. Thank you. Well, I would also immediately now take uh, David Hammerstein, because since you've also been addressed, Mr. De Vigne, maybe we can then flow also into your presentation. Please. Uh, we have taken for granted that all of these enforcement measures, the criminal injunctions, will boost innovation, that it's a win-win situation. I don't think we should take that for granted at all. I think it's something, I think it's a myth. Has there been any serious evaluation of what this means for innovation? We have thousands of companies and firms who risk the gray area of intellectual property rights. In this gray area, they move into it, and that's the process of innovation, because they know they're not going to go to jail for 20 years in some country for doing it. If they think they're going to risk 20 years, and not just some civil um, penalty, and not a criminal penalty, they might not do it. Has this been really evaluated on a world scale? That's on one side, on the innovation agenda. Then on the other side is the development agenda. I've seen in the World Health Organization, year after year, how countries like Brazil and India are making proposals about technology transfer. They're making proposals about new ways of promoting innovation, for example, in medicine, because the present ways do not work. So I see that kind of what we're doing now with this process of ACTA is to ossify, petrify, to really to totally freeze into our present <coughs> model when half the world is talking about new models for innovation that help development in a more fair way and sharing that development with technology transfer, innovation prizes, all kinds of ideas, like let's say for medicines, but also on other levels of copyright, like the Treaty for the Blind, that the European Union opposes the right to read for 300 million visually impaired people because of IPR. It is opposed to a treaty for the blind in the world intellectual property. They've said it openly. They're against this treaty. The Commission tells me every day, Luke is shaking his head. And why? Because obviously they're on an agenda that we have the elevator of IPR protection and enforcement has to keep on going up. And we Sir, cannot make could you it answer a question, please? My, my question is, don't you think making clear limitations and exceptions that are socially just in this world are a way of making the whole IPR system more legitimate? Okay, so first with the, the question, I, I think we're in complete agreement on this issue of, of disclosure and transparency. I'd note that it is, I agree with you, it's not just about the text. It's very often about the access to information requests, to freedom of information requests, depending on your country, uh, that have been consistently denied uh, or blacked out in such a way that there's virtually no information that's been disclosed. And the rationale, in some instances, for not disclosing this information, I think is, is positively shocking. In the United States, some of the non-disclosure some of the non-disclosure that we've seen on the basis of freedom of information requests on ACTA have been on, the, on national security grounds. This is copyright law as if this is, this is akin to nuclear secrets. 
It's positively absurd to suggest, based on the document that now I've, I venture to say just about everybody in the room has seen, that this is a national security issue. I mean, it just clearly is not. And so the lack of disclosure that we often see through FOIA or ATI systems has been woefully inadequate, and I don't think up to the standard that citizens ought to expect uh, within democracies. In terms of David's point, I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think in many ways, my point in terms of say, concerns about sort of dealing with ACTA and, and siphoning off all the IP enforcement without taking into account what is, I think, a more holistic, broader view of what advancing an IP agenda means I think is enormously problematic. But I don't think it, few countries will say that they've done much in the way of study because everybody keeps telling us that this doesn't change their laws. So what do we need to study if this is exactly what we already find in the Aki or what we already find uh, in, in the United States or in Australia? What's the point of studying if this is already where we're at? I'd argue that we do need study, both in terms of what the benefits of some of these provisions will be, but as well, the costs. If we to take just one example, on the issue of graduated response or notice systems, in the places where there have been studies about what this will cost, if you take a look, for example, at the regulatory assessment in the UK on the digital economy bill, if you take a look at the costs that have come out in New Zealand on the Section 92A reform, you find that we are talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars that are borne by intermediaries. In some instances, particularly for smaller ISPs, costs that are so high that they would, they would find themselves completely uncompetitive in the market. Marketplace. So there are very real costs, but there's been a real reluctance to address them head on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Geis. I am aware there's also been a question which has been directed to Mr. Devigny, and I'm just interrupting um, to also hand over to your presentation. Mr. Devigny is, as I announced, the chief negotiator for the Commission, and as there are always more sides to the story than one. I think it's also very important to hear actually from those who are negotiating this agreement what the picture is from that point of view. So I'm very happy, first of all, also that you've sort of taken or dared to step into the lion's cage and coming and, and also to give us the inside look from how the Commission's perspective on this issue. So That's scary. Um, outlook, and I must say that I was a bit surprised both by the poster with uh, the hand up on the, the laptop computer, which is not quite how we see ACT on one hand, and secondly, I was a bit surprised to be in a panel that we're talking about uh, IP without IP right holders uh, on the panel, but that's, that's of course, not um, my show, that's your, your choice. Before, I'm a, I'm an before, Yes, we all are. I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, I mean professional. Um, but before I go to my presentation, I would like first to answer Mrs. Sinnetfeld because I think uh, she raised an important issue. And uh, no, Mrs. Sinnetfeld, I do not agree with you. Democracy is not a bummer. This is not the policy of the Commission. This is not a policy of, of our Commissioner, for sure. Uh, and we take this thing seriously. As you know, the Commission is the guardian of the treaties, one of the very important criteria that makes our European model um, uh, so I think uh, worth defending is democracy. So I do not uh, take this lightly. I uh, should add that we did inform INTAC committee uh, about uh, many details of what was ongoing, of course, uh, according to the level of the negotiations. You're not a member of the INTAC committee, but uh, this, is, this, is what, this is what's been done. In any case, we are, we commissioned in favor of transparency of releasing the document. Even if it was only because it makes our life easier, because it is very difficult to keep saying things which should dispel a number of myths which are perpetually put on the internet or wherever, and uh, being told, ah, yes, but because you don't show the document, we, we, don't, we don't believe you. Which, by the way, is ironic because if you believe that the person to whom you ask questions is going to lie, you should stop answering and asking questions, but that's another issue. But even if we were, uh, if, even if we were uh, uh, what we are not, uh, lying or whatever, the Parliament in any case knows very well that we're going to put, or we're going to have to put this through its consent, and so uh, we will be judged on what we said. And I think it would be political uh, suicide, and I don't think anyone likes to commit that, uh, to lie to the Parliament on this issue. Um, so uh, I hope that my colleagues uh, from the other uh, negotiating parties of ACTA in New Zealand will agree to our request for 
uh, full transparency, and that will make uh, our, our life easier. Um, as to uh, a question which has been asked also on WIPO enforcement, uh, it is true there is a committee enforcement in WIPO. It is dealing with treaty on the blind, access to medicine, which are extremely important topic, and I do not agree that the Commission is stopping uh, uh, these, these issues. But let's put, it clear, let's put it clearly, enforcement goes beyond that. And it is very difficult to go beyond that. We were, we were stopped to merely share with the WTO partners our experience, not, not trying to say that others should do as we do. We were simply willing to, to say, OK, this is how we enforce IP in the EU. This is what our border uh, controls make. This is, this is how we work. This is the kind of rights we control. This is the kind of um, trade channel we control. And this is prohibited. We can't even speak. It's very rarely seen in WTO forum that countries block an item on the agenda, being merely on the agenda. But this is the reality, and it's been ongoing for now several years. So I think the countries who are opposing these uh, uh, items to be on the agenda should not be surprised that uh, the countries who are willing to go beyond and to defend their intellectual property because they see it important for many reasons. And what I'll come to a second, um, take another venue. I mean, you cannot have your cake and eat it. You cannot oppose a topic to be an agenda and at the same time prevent others to continue speaking. Um, with that, I, I will start my presentation, uh, which will uh, not be, of course, very different from the presentation I made uh, to the stakeholders meeting because there is no new event since, um, since two weeks. Um, and uh, I would like to give a couple of caveats, though. I will not comment on other countries' position. I will uh, explain what the position of the EU is, but I have no right to comment on other countries' position. If other countries are willing to engage in transparency exercise, they can do so. Uh, and uh, similarly, I do not intend to comment on leaks, but if uh, what you see in a leaked document you think is uh, a problem, I will, I'm willing to, to address this and to put it in parallel with what the EU position is in reality and not um, in mythology, because I'm afraid that this is the level which we've reached uh, so far. So if I can start by again reminding why do we have ACTA. And um, to remind everyone, though, that uh, the European economy relies on innovation, creativity, and brand exclusivity. This is very clear, and this is something which is at the heart of our motivation. Now, everybody knows that IP rights are territorial, and therefore, as soon as you start exporting, you are facing a potential uh, protection problem because your rights may not be as well protected when you export as it is the case in Europe. Um, we are facing a solid increase of counterfeiting and piracy. Um, I quote the custom seizures, which are available on the website of our, my colleagues of uh, DG Taxed, um, also on DG Trade, there is a link, plus 225% in one year. That is quite impressive, and it is quite the demonstration that the current international enforcement of IP is at least not up to uh, the speed of the increasing uh, problem. Dangerous counterfeits increase, moreover, toys, cosmetics, electrical appliances, medicines. Um, and I'm not, uh, because I've been accused of putting in the same category problems of patent infringement for medicines and problem of counterfeiting of medicines. I am not putting that into a category. Of, in the same category, of course, these are different issues. But counterfeit medicine, the genuine counterfeit medicine, if I may speak so, that is to say the, the dangerous substances do increase and, uh, and, and the seizure uh, on the customs demonstrated. The OECD study to which Michael Geis has been referring to, uh, the number of the international trade of physical counterfeit goods is $250 billion per year. That is only what is internationally traded, so it doesn't include domestic consumption, and it doesn't include intangible goods, so no, nothing through internet, etc. It's exclusively what is uh, physical trade. This, this number is, is higher than the GDP of 160 countries. I've mentioned how difficult it is to address the problem uh, of IP enforcement in um, the traditional instances, if you want, of WTO, WIPO, or even WCO. And this is why um, the countries who are willing to go ahead have started ACTA. I think everybody knows by, by now who are the parties um, around the table. Uh, one point, though, that we've been, we've been told, and it is true, that perhaps the countries which are the most problematic in terms of source of counterfeiting are not around the table for the reasons that I've just explained. But the idea is very much, of course, to welcome them. 
uh, and if they are willing to join, well, I think they can do so, and we are clearly designing the agreement in a manner which, which can be um, done so. Uh, yes, I say that uh, ACTA will remain in line with the EU acquis, and um, I've heard uh, Michael Guy saying that, well, it's not possible because the acquis is different from other countries' law, so perhaps it is a problem for other countries, but this is European Union. And I can understand that as a Canadian citizen, you may be willing to lobby your government if you think your government has to change its laws. But uh, for the EU, this is uh, very clearly the position. And we have an, uh, uh, a team uh, in, in the negotiation which is, of course, including several uh, commissioners or a representative of several commissioners, several director generals. And uh, I can guarantee you that this is a, the, the, the point that we're making is the one which is unanimously viewed, including by those who draft EU law as fully respecting EU law. So um, clearly no three-strike rule. Now you've, you've interestingly, very cleverly, I must say, threaded on a, on a thin line. You said, well, it's not really compulsory, but it's in a footnote. Well, is it compulsory or is it not compulsory? As a law professor, you will agree that either it is compulsory or it is not. If it is not compulsory, it is fine, because it is the case in Europe that three-strike rule is not compulsory, and we're defending that. If other countries are willing to give examples or whatever, or that is not our problem because this will not bind the ACTA partners. So is there a three-strike rule in the negotiations? No. Has everyone asked for it? No. Uh, would we agree to it? No. Um, change to ISP role and uh, reliability. You've mentioned also um, in your part that there were substantive problems uh, for that. Well, we do not see it. And again, this is the view, including of the services to draft uh, EU law. Um, I do know that uh, perhaps the regime of uh, ISP is different in the US and the EU, uh, although I do not think that the EU or the US are countries where internet is particularly underdeveloped. Um, and um, clearly here we will have uh, no change of our European legislation. Same for respect of privacy data protection. We have read the uh, carefully, and we have been replied in detail to the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor report uh, on these issues, and we have absolutely no problem with the issues which are raised because, again, we do not change the law there. We do not change anything. We do not create this super, I don't know, customs border for IP, which I've been uh, writing about uh, sometimes. Um, ACTA deals only about enforcement and no substantive IP provisions. I maintain that. Um, you've, ra you've given examples uh, in your presentation to contradict that. Uh, again, I can only comment about the EU position. You've mentioned statutory damages. We do not have that in the EU, therefore we will not accept them. Um, you mentioned anti-circumvention uh, devices. Here again, we will not go beyond our legislation. Notice and take down. Yes, we have them in the EU in certain form which are different than other countries, but it's not true that we would not have them uh, today, um, and we will not change that again. Uh, camcording, uh, we have no specific um, uh, crime, if you want, um, of camcording in, in Europe legislation at the European level. Some countries have it, but not at the European level. And here again, we will not, we will not accept it. So I totally disagree with all the examples you've given to say that there will be some substantive IP provisions. Um, so again, you may call me a liar, but at least um, this, is, this is very clearly the Commission uh, position, and I will stand by it. Uh, as to scope, yes, uh, you have mentioned that there are differences in scope between, um, between uh, parties. Um, it, well, you mentioned patents. Uh, patents are already part of uh, the European IP legislation in terms of enforcement uh, when it comes uh, for border, for, for civil sanction. It is not the case for criminal sanction, and by the way, criminal sanctions are not uh, negotiated by the Commission, are negotiated by the Presidency, and I greet uh, my colleagues uh, from Spanish Presidency who are doing that. Uh, since there is no um, criminalization of patent infringement in European law, we will not accept that, but I don't even think that anyone has proposed it. So I don't think here, again, uh, there is a room uh, for uh, concern. Um, structure of ACTA, I think everybody knows it by now. Um, I will, of course, concentrate on the substance, uh, which is the legal framework, the second uh, chapter. Um, here again, um, the, and I've, I've put the legal references so that you can see 
where uh, is the EU law uh, already is the position, the base for the EU position, and uh, I've uh, quoted the four directives uh, regarding uh, each of the main major section of this legal framework of ACTA, civil enforcement, border measures, criminal enforcement, and internet enforcement. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the transparency. I will not go back uh, by saying that we are requesting transparency. This is clear. But um, it is not true, uh, though, that uh, many international negotiations are conducted in public. I do not know any free trade agreements which are publicly uh, negotiated. Even in WTO, even the TRIPS Council session is not public. I'm not that I'm in favor of that, but I just make the point because I cannot accept that this would be the only non-public negotiation. In any case, again, we're in favor of releasing negotiating documents so that everybody can see that uh, what we are defending is the, the reality, and it is true that we should not uh, base ourselves on, on leaks. Um, as you know, the next round is in New Zealand uh, from 12 to 16 April. I understand that uh, you will be there anyway. You're most welcome um, for the civil society meeting, uh, but this is the New Zealand government who's the host, so it's not up to me to invite you. We'll be very happy to continue discussions there or with uh, any other uh, stakeholders. Um, and uh, this will be uh, the eighth round, and it will be the first round where we will uh, discuss certain chapters which have not been discussed yet, particularly the anti-circumvention uh, measures. Thank you very much. We are putting the summary of each round uh, of ACTA uh, on our website. That's the summary agreed by the all ACTA parties. And of course, we very, um, we'll be very happy to answer any questions you have or by email um, if there's anyone who has any, any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. De Vigna. I already have four speakers on my list. First, uh, Sophie Infeld, Renate Weber, then we'll go here. Okay, I'm taking, I'm taking you down. But first, uh, Sophie, please. Thanks, Gerald. I'll try and be brief. First of all, Mr. De Vigne, you, you started by talking about uh, the need to trust the European Commission. Well, we do have a little problem here, and I have the feeling that is maybe because of the policy of the European Commission to present a, a proposal with the image of a pipe, and then, like Magritte, saying, ceci n'est pas une pipe, and trying to convince people that, indeed, it is not a pipe. Maybe you should change that approach. Three strikes is not compulsory, you say. Then why is it in the agreement in the first place? If it is up to countries to decide for themselves, there is really no reason why it should be in the agreement. The European Parliament has discussed the three strikes over and over and over again. Our position is clear. We do not want it. Maybe this is something to keep in mind if you come to the European Parliament for its consent. Secondly, second question, I'd like to get a bit more clarity about the, uh, the, the, the companies sitting in on, on the talks or not sitting in on the talks because you, you say that, you know, oh, but we've been very transparent because we informed the INTA Committee of the European Parliament. Well, you know, that's not my kind of transparency. I think it is for citizens all citizens to know what the negotiations are about. And I find it a bit odd that private companies, and I'm a liberal, you know, I, I, I love business life, but I do think that citizens have rights too. And if companies are allowed to sit in on the talks or at least be informed on the talks, then I would like to know why normal citizens cannot have access to the documents. Well, very briefly, even more brief than, than yourself. Three strike rule, yes, no, it's not compulsory. We didn't, we didn't put that. But we're not responsible if others are willing to give examples. We were opposing it. I've said, I, I, I don't know if I've been not clear, I've said nobody has asked for compulsory three strike rule. And even if somebody were to ask it, we would oppose it. I mean, I cannot be more clear than that. I beg your pardon? You asked for the floor. You will be later on. Well, that's, that's the reality. No three strike rule compulsory. I mean, more clear than that, I, I, I cannot do it. Okay, Secondly, to, inter to interrupt you, if, if it's not compulsory, then why does it have to be in there? Then let every. But it's not in there, madam. It is not in there. Ask Professor Geis if you don't believe me because you believe him. Well, uh, indeed, I don't believe <laughs> He will tell you it's not in there. Um, 
Now, the second uh, topic which you've raised, I don't quite understand it. You mentioned companies. There are no companies anywhere uh, in ACTA negotiations. Simply none. Thank you. All right. I'm sure there's enough space for discussion. Renate Weber, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to say that it's not a matter of be not believing that the person who is talking to us is not telling the truth. Because if we would think that you, for example, lie, or I don't know, in general terms, someone from the commission, I think that we should go better home and do other things. But when it's such a lack of transparency, I think that each of us is entitled to believe in I don't know what kind of conspiracy theory after all, because you don't provide us with the text, so we should know, is there there the, in the text or not? Why should we ask, I mean, each of you, one of, or one of you not seeing the official text, yeah? Again, only some, some leaks, so this is a problem indeed. And my question is, if, for example, because in, in this kind of, Top secrecy negotiations, we don't know in the end what will be, how the, the text will look like. Can we be sure that if some of these provisions that we so strongly have fought against will be in the text, you will not agree with the text? Well, I don't know if it's such, of course, when I don't know anything about. I mean, it's just rumors. And let me tell you something which I found really, uh, in a way depressing, in a way. A couple of days ago, I came from Buenos Aires, and I entered a plane, which was a Lufthansa flight, to Frankfurt, with my water, which I brought somewhere in Buenos Aires, because nobody couldn't care less at the control, at the security control, about what I had. Nobody even asked me to, to pull out the, the laptop, yeah? I arrived in Frankfurt, when I had some dulce de leche, which is a creamy thing, and of course I had to give it that because it was not in a sealed uh, envelope, yes? And this is just to show that the truth is, it, it's very much hypocrisy. We are making our lives more and more difficult for ourselves, while in fact there is an entire world out there who doesn't bother us. <laughs> is it the case again? With this, this new actor? Well, on transparency, uh, fully agree with you. Our life, including the Commission's life, will be a lot simpler when the text will be released. So um, uh, I can only uh, hope uh, that, uh, that our, our colleagues or partners around ACTA will, will agree with that. Um, and I'm not sure I've understood the question on, the <laughs> on your second part, but if the question relates to border controls in general for any IP rate infringement, there will be no new, uh, uh, if you want, measures or new legislation uh, on this. I'm sorry, my question relates to three strikes, data, privacy, all these very sensitive issues for us. If something like this will be in the treaty, in the final text, which I'm sure we will not know actually before, will the, the Commission oppose? They will, exactly. The Commission will not accept anything that goes beyond our current European legislation, and therefore these things do go beyond, and therefore we will oppose it, and therefore it will not be in a treaty, because it's a consensus-based treaty. But you can't get any clearer than that. I would say. We have now one, two, three, four, five speakers further on the list, and I would also close it at that point um, unless anybody indicates now that they wish to receive for one more. Okay, but then, so um, please. Hello, Mr. Devine. Um, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman, co founder and spokesperson for La Quadrature du Net, and I've got. Um, First of all, uh, a quick comment. Uh, the, there are provisions about the circumvention of technical measures in ACTA. And uh, we got a directive in Europe called the UCD. You know it better than, than I do, the UCD 2001 directive. And we're still waiting for an impact assessment. 
And actually, in many countries, it has been proven to fail. Uh, some innovators just moved away from Europe and notably from France uh, because of those provisions. And there's still no impact study, and therefore we will uh, cement, petrify, as Mr. Hammerstein told it before, those dispositions. So I find this a, a bit shocking. But it's not my, ma my main concern. My main concern is even if we believed you, I didn't, I didn't say it. Even if we believed you about n not going further than the EU acquis with your part of the negotiation, you told us that the criminal sanction part are being negotiated by the council, by the presidency. So some parts are being negotiated and they are the, the strongest, the most uh, dissuasive, the most important parts of the criminal sanctions. Uh, in some leaks you won't comment on. We found some wordings going straight out of the IPRED to directive the part about inciting and abetting and aiding and so on. Uh, we also find the wording about the commercial scale being the only limit to the scope of the treaty. And um, nothing uh, is given to help interpret this notion of commercial scale. And we think it's a, it's a, a trap because anyone will interpret it in its own way. And we already know how Vivendi Universal interpret uh, one million people doing one non-commercial act as being a commercial scale. So this is very shocking. And so we, we have uh, unelected people who are now negotiating criminal sanctions. Can you tell us that this is the normal process in trade agreements to have negotiated criminal sanctions? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, very briefly, then. Um, on the commercial scale, I mean, there's nothing shocking. Commercial scale is a criteria in the EU since 1994, as it is in all WTO members. So there's nothing new. And yes, it is true that commercial scale is not defined, um, just like many other legal concepts are not defined. I mean, uh, I can think of the good faith concept. You know, contracts have to be executive of good faith in French law. Good faith is not, de is not defined. It's left to the judges, appreciation. So it's not exactly Vivendi, to quote you, who would define what is commercial scale. It's up to a judge, which is rather different. Um, and indeed, commercial scale is the law for the EU, and it will not change. And we will not change uh, that neither. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's the only question. Do you, you want another about question? The, about negotiating criminal sanctions. Ah, negotiating criminal sanctions, yes. There are many, uh, I mean, criminal sanctions of IP, of intellectual property in enforcement, is kind of become uh, relatively common in most free trade agreements. There is a, a, a chapter or a section on that, you, either the FTAs of the EU or the FTAs of the US, etc. And there is nothing abnormal there. Of course, as long as there is no new criminalization, if you want, or there is no change to the criminal law, but I guarantee you that I don't think member states uh, to start with, since it's a rotating presidency on their behalf who negotiates these uh, provisions, would accept it because they'd be schizophrenic. Why would they refuse something in the council and accept it through an international negotiation? Of course not. So it's all consistent with the existing law. And uh, as you can imagine, there will be no new um, criminalization or change of criminal law uh, through these negotiations in Europe. Thank you Thanks. very much. We're now going to bundle, taking two questions at a time. First, Mrs. Lichtenberger, and then. Okay, um, of course, Mr. De Vinia, there were some questions left open when you were talking, uh, which is uh, nothing new to me. But anyway, um, if you say commercial scale, um, which interpretation then will you be using for the European context? from which uh, proposal or whatsoever. Which interpretation of the term commercial scale will be used then if it's not defined? And it can't be defined conclusively in this international treaty. Second question, so if there's no change at all in Europe, what the hell is the whole thing for if we don't have countries like China, etc., on board? Um, I mean, what does that help? What, that, uh, what does that really help for the problem that we have with counterfeiting? So why don't we limit it to it and really go for it? Why don't we really 
uh, uh, look for a more focused approach on the whole issue. Why do we include lots of things that raise uh, uh, lots of concerns in people uh, concerning uh, civil rights? Why is there no mentioning on the limits uh, that civil rights um, safeguarding would pose on these treaties? And uh, at last, one word to the trust that you ask us to have. If, I, I do read very carefully lots of uh, proposals from the Commission, and this does not really give me the trust that lots of things that you re right now excluded would not be, let's say, in the uh, master plan of the European uh, Commission to bring on the table in, within the next month and years. Joe McNamee from European Digital Rights. I just, Joe McNamee, European Digital Rights. I just like to say I believe everything Mr. Devine says always. Two weeks ago, he stood up in the Commission. He said nobody has ever proposed three strikes at all in this context. Today, he says, okay, there is a footnote which does mention three strikes or acknowledged it. So I believe him today, I believe him last week, and I'll believe him next week. The problem is that <laughs> dynamic believing. Um, I'm sure Mr. Deving knows that in uh, the rules of treaty um, uh, interpretation, proprietary works have a legal significance. And if the footnote is there, and the footnote is subsequently deleted, if the only text that was there explaining what these policies were supposed to mean is um, cutting people off, then that will be the only interpretation open, regardless of whether this text is in the final document or not. And one final point that any of the MEPs could, could answer. Mr. Deving thinks you're confused. You don't understand the resolution that you adopted, and he will save you from yourselves. When you said that, you, that the negotiations should be restricted to counterfeiting, you didn't understand that's what you were voting for, and the Commission is going to save you from yourselves, and they're going to continue on as before. In the unlikely possibility that you didn't really mean that, could you perhaps share this information with Mr. Devine? Thank you. Well, Mr. McNamee, <laughs> I'm very happy you believe me and that you don't believe in myth. I said that nobody has ever asked three strike rule to be compulsory in this treaty, and I stand by it. I said as well, I, yes, this is what I said. Uh, well, we can, whatever, <laughs> this is what I said. And I've said, as I've added, that if somebody were to propose it, we would oppose it. And I think you will have great difficulty proving me the contrary. Um, I'm not sure I understood your uh, resolution thing. Uh, I understand that you were taking some uh, role of I don't know, advocating uh, something. I mean, I've never said anything against the resolution of the European Parliament, if this is what you're mentioning. I'm not even mentioning here, so I don't, I don't see where is your problem there. Shall I try to perhaps uh, as well? Yeah. To Mrs. Lichten, Lichten at the same time, or? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes? Sorry? Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, you, 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 you ask about the commercial scale, you say that there is no interpretation. It is true, and it is deliberately so, because in Europe, in our legislation, there is no definition of the commercial scale. Why? Because of the history of negotiations, because some people want this, some people want that. Now, the result is that it's up to the judges to, to interpret these criteria, and it's up, not up to us, nor the, during these negotiations, to change that. If there is a will, a will to change the EU law, well, there is process for that, uh, and it has to be decided by uh, member states, commission, and parliament. But it, today, we are bound by the existing legislation. And if we were to start defining commercial scale, we would be accused of going beyond the current law. So we cannot be <laughs> accused of not going enough or going too far. Um, 
Then you mentioned uh, civil rights, uh, which are very important, and we have, uh, I think, I'm not sure if put it in writing, but we certainly mentioned that we didn't want, to, uh, we mentioned that during negotiations, that we didn't want anything to be changed in that because we know it's a sensitive topic. We know it's not going to be the case because there's not going to be change to EU law. Um, and last but not least, if you don't trust us, well, you will have the text anyway, so you can see it by yourself. Thanks. I hope so too. <laughs> now we have the final round of questions, starting off with Baroness Ludford, Erika Mann, and then the lady. Next round, sir, sir, we're already late. Yes, I, I just wondered um, how we kind of arrived at this point and whether the Commission anticipated such a controversy, uh, tried to um, take decisions which would have um, maximized support rather than maximized opposition whether fundamental rights considerations were taken into account uh, from the beginning. I mean, in a sense, I think it's very unfortunate because I think there would be considerable support for um, proper uh, and reasonable enforcement of IP. I think a lot of us have sympathy for uh, both the creative industries um, and uh, obviously on things like medicines speaking of someone married to a type 1 diabetic, the thought that he could get counterfeit insulin is just too horrible to, to contemplate. And there's a lot of other people, obviously, who would be affected by uh, pharmaceutical issues. So how come we've arrived at this point where there isn't broad public support, uh, at, you know, and, and for, for instance, what the Parliament is suggesting, limiting it to counterfeiting, um, or even to... Um, uh, a, a, a narrow sort of agenda on IP and what is happening obviously is that everyone is, is, is up in arms about the threat to internet freedom. Um, I'm just wondering how we managed to blunder into this situation. Um, Eileen, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. De Vigne, I, I'm wondering if you would agree from the Commission side and, and the Council certainly as well that you would give access to certain limited numbers of people which from broad range uh, from industry and beyond industry of certainly under confidentiality rules, but would this be an option uh, which you would consider and which you would um, regard as open? <coughs> And my second is, by the way, I'm, I'm not sure in this case, because you mentioned it's, um, you, uh, you uh, use the same rules like an FDA's and WTO procedure in giving access to uh, the, uh, the European Parliament to the, uh, to the documents. Does this mean uh, that the Parliament, the chairman of the committee, and the coordinators of the Trade Committee had full access to the all documents which are up negotiated right now, because that's the procedure? Okay. Um, Eileen Oshpusha of Leiden University. Um, you referred to um, that you referred to the fact that um, discussion in the WTO in the TRIPS Council is uh, blocked with regard to uh, enforcement of intellectual property rights. And I assume that you uh, refer to the EC proposal to the TRIPS Council in the mid 90s, um, in which um, the, uh, developing countries disagreed with the fact that um, the TRIPS Council has a mandate to review enforcement on the ground. So, um, in my view, um, this is about uh, unclarity about the scope of obligation to enforce intellectual property rights on the ground. So, my question is, um, to what extent does the ACTA clarify this in, in that sense that in which, uh, to what extent does it lay down other benchmarks than in the TRIPS agreement? And what is the added value of the ACTA if developing countries or countries in development like China do not join the uh, do not uh, join the negotiations and is there a strategy to induce them to join the agreement? Um, first question of Baroness Watford. Um, why not such a, a broader public support? Well, I'm hardly neutral on the issue. <laughs> So um, I wonder, because it is, it's a very good question that you're asking, because 
there is indeed concern in this very parliament. I've been asked to speak several times at, um, at, at the request of uh, groups on counterfeiting. Uh, I know it's a, it's a concern, it's a topic that's concerning several MEPs. Um, but why so much fuss about uh, the internet aspect of ACTA? I do not know. I do not make the fuss. I'm trying to dispel the myth. So I'm afraid. Mismanaged. Well, the problem is you can call it mismanagement. You can call it uh, differently. I mean, if, if systematically what you say is not believed, um, is transformed, uh, is misspelled, etc. I mean, the only thing you can do is to be as transparent as possible, and I hope we're going to have success on this, and that the negotiating text will be available for the public, so we are beyond simply making them available for Intel, or Chairman, etc., and, and that everybody will see by himself, by himself. Um, but uh, I take your point that uh, perhaps uh, uh, we should be better communicator or whatever, but uh, we are dealing with a situation uh, which uh, has gone, as I said often, uh, mythological. Mythological. There are, there are myths on this issue. Um, Mrs. Mann has asked about the, whether the industry will have access. I think here again we are, we are beyond that. We are, we are asking now for full transparency uh, for the public because we think that's, that's the only solution. So I think it's kind of overtaken by events. I think it would have been a, a good question. Although if the industry had that access, I had to, def to justify that only the industry can have access and not citizens or consumers, etc., and then we would get into this, this kind of debate, and then eventually what's the difference between some citizens and not wider public, so that's not easy. Um, uh, the lady uh, asked about um, the w what I meant by WTO uh, blocked agenda. I was actually referring uh, to not the mid-90s. I was referring to much more recent um, experiences of uh, this year, of last year, of the year before, where systematically we are faced opposition to put enforcement on the agenda. Um, and I take the point that, of course, it would be an ideal situation if the countries which are the largest source of counterfeit would be around the table. Um, I think to induce them, to quote your, your own word, to induce China, I think is uh, not exactly uh, on the agenda. I don't think anyone induces China. Um, but um, it, is, it is to be hoped, and I, I have no clear uh, of course, crystal ball on this, but it's to be hoped that a number of countries will see this as, as progress. Um, perhaps not, um, but uh, this, is, this is the only solution that we have for the time being, is to start, uh, make examples of certain countries willing to go, be, uh, to go forward and hope that others will join, but there will be no inducement and, of course, there is no guarantee of success. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Um, so since we're already running late, just one short respond, Mr. McNamee, yes. It was no, just to your question, yes, we know what we did. And, uh, <laughs> and we meant it that way. Uh, and then I know that uh, Dr. Geist also is um, requesting to respond. Just, just quickly, I, I, I must say that I, I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news here because you've said several times that you think your life will be easier once the text is released. And hearing you speak and, and I believe what you say I actually think that that's now not the case because you can look at substantive provisions that I put forward and say they're not substantive you can take a look at a three strikes footnote admittedly a footnote and say that it's not there I mean frankly if there's a myth here I don't think it's happening from this side of the house but what I do think it is is that there are clearly people looking at text and seeing two totally different things and so even when this text is released I fear that it is not going to make your life any easier at all. And in many respects, I think what it's doing is undermining the credibility and stoking the fear that you're hearing amongst many elected representatives. Uh, if, if, uh, just to, to clarify, it will make my life as EU easier. I'm not saying it's going to make the life of everybody around the table of ACTA. And I don't have to comment the, the, the position of the other parties. What I say is that the EU is defending exclusively its legislation. and. I am. I, I know that is the reality, and you will not be capable of proving me the contrary. Thank you. Okay. I hope you will take the time afterwards at the reception also to go in 
intensively into in depth. But as I said, we're running a little bit late, and I'm very happy now to introduce uh, Stefan Kravchik from eBay um, to get a perspective of basically what would it mean for private business and especially for a company dealing a lot with goods which would have to protect themselves and their customers from counterfeited goods. So without any due delay, I understand that you do not need a laptop for this. No. Okay, then please go ahead. Thank you, um, Alexander. And, and I'm probably one of the first uh, internet companies sitting in a conference like this, not using a PowerPoint presentation. Very low tech, and I, I really apologize, but it's just because I prefer you looking at me than looking up there to the higher power on the screen. Um, first of all, um, a lot of people in this house uh, know me as someone. No, I don't need a laptop at all, you know. My laptop is at home, and um, I usually agree on everything with Luc de Vigne, um, and that's because he's virtually always right. There is just one small um, detail that I should mention. There is at least one rights owner sitting at this table uh, with uh, a bunch of registered trademarks, um, and that's eBay. Uh, we are uh, a very big brand owner. Uh, we have a very well-known brand. Um, of course, there may be people in this room who don't know eBay, but I, I'm sure uh, without any arrogance that probably most of you know what, who eBay is. Uh, or think you know who eBay is and know the brand. So we are a rights owner. We're very proud of our brand. We're up there with the, the, the famous brands in the world. And we're fighting for the integrity of our brand. And we're also fighting for the integrity and the protection of many, many brand owners, uh, the products of, of whom, of which are being sold on our platform. Um, I, I deplore, oh, there's my good friend, Luke. I, I actually deplore the fact that, uh, that there has been so much mystery about uh, ACTA, and I even more deplore the fact that Luke has been spending the better part of his professional life for the last couple of years uh, having to sit in meetings like this, talking about ACTA, justifying ADFA, uh, ACTA, and trying to explain in as much as the, the, the non-disclosure obligations allow him what it might be about, could be about, etc. because. During all that time, he could actually be sitting around the table with the governments of Russia, of China, of Indonesia, of Malaysia, of Taiwan, of Thailand, of Turkey, and ever so many other countries that are the true sources of massive uh, flows of counterfeit products, uh, and who, if you would simply apply the basic principles of TRIPS, and if you would use the WTO system to take them to task through the dispute settlement, might actually improve uh, their enforcement systems without the need for ACTA. So we could actually uh, be much more effective against counterfeiting if we weren't spending all our time talking about ACTA uh, and negotiating about ACTA. So uh, that is to, to set the scene a little bit from where we're coming from. Let me just say a few things about eBay a few things about eBay fighting counterfeiting, um, then something that I haven't necessarily heard today, how to look at ACTA in the light of the EU digital agenda, uh, and then ACTA and the European Parliament in particular after that uh, wonderful resolution that was passed uh, very recently. Um, in the beginning I said some of you may think they know eBay, um, and why do I say that? Because um, well, you may know that we've been found, founded actually uh, about 15 years ago in 1995. And up until today, we're still known by a lot of people as the auction side. Uh, let me assure you that eBay still does auction, but that the auction part of eBay is actually diminishing day by day. And if in the past we were predominantly an auction site, we're now a pure e-commerce uh, site we're a platform where the auction business model is actually diminishing. We're at 45% auctions today, and we expect to be only at 30% auctions in uh, two years from now, which means that in two years from now, 70% of what is sold on eBay uh, by buyers and sellers who use our platform to get together and, and make their transactions online, 70% of that will actually be direct sales for a fixed price and most of those sellers will be business sellers, business to consumers. Um, 
we are one of the leading information society uh, service providers in Europe. Uh, we have a presence in 39 markets, and you may not know, but we have 90 million users on eBay. We employ about 3,500 people in Europe, and that is a little bit under a quarter of our workforce. So we employ about 14,500 people worldwide. That is important in this context because we are a big, powerful company with a massive legal department uh, with a host of very talented people who know about regulations and rules and about counterfeiting, about fighting counterfeiting. Um, we are in a comfortable position and a lot of our colleagues are also in a comfortable position, the ones at Google and Amazon and, and, and other internet companies. But think for one moment, and I'll get back to that when I speak about the digital agenda, about all, all the newcomers, about all the small players, all the SMEs, all the new innovative internet companies who would like to make a business on internet. Because their position is extremely important when we dis discuss uh, things like ACTA and what additional obligations that may impose about new players in this environment. Um, just to give you an impression of what kind of money we're talking about, uh, the transactions uh, on eBay in 2008, 2009 figures are not yet public, uh, were about $60 billion uh, globally. Um, and then the business opportunities that eBay creates in Europe, um, we now have throughout the European Union 350,000 businesses selling on eBay. 350,000 predominantly small and medium-sized enterprises that actually have a shop on eBay and use our platform, and they would also use other platforms and search engines, etc., to um, sell their goods, to make a business on eBay. And they're often in remote areas where this is the only way that they, uh, they can run their business. So, important to know what this e-commerce background is because... Um, the title of my intervention today was The Impact on Private Business on ACTA. I would also actually say it's about innovation uh, and about newcomers. What is the impact of ACTA on innovation and, and newcomers? And the simple answer to that for me is if they, the negotiating parties, get ACTA right, then the impact is either going to be minimal or nothing at all because, as so many people before me have said, this is a negotiation of the willing I must, and, and of the ones who act, actually have proven that they already know how to enforce uh, intellectual uh, property rights. I would not entirely include Mexico and, and Morocco in that, uh, but they're the, the coalition of the willing hangers-on and, and, and they want to be also good pupils in the class. And, and so. I'm sure that they will get there. But the overwhelming majority of negotiating parties of, of ACTA are countries that already have a very good track record in fighting counterfeiting and piracy. So again, if the negotiating parties get it right, and I'll tell you later on what we think right is, um, then I don't think we'll feel a big difference. Um, however, if they don't get it right, if ACTA is indeed what so many people think it is, based on all the leaked documents, if it actually goes beyond just fighting counterfeiting and piracy, if it is about, uh, for example, infringement of intellectual property rights, which under each and every different jurisdiction may mean something completely different. It may not be limited to fake uh, and illegal goods. Um, then we enter into a whole new area where uh, a lot of countries may have to change their laws very substantially, uh, which will make it very difficult uh, for players. If uh, far-reaching criminal sanctions uh, are introduced, again, you'll see uh, a lot of different legal systems that may have to adapt to that. If so, if in our view ACTA isn't gotten right, then you see a major impact on business, in particular on the new innovative companies, who will not be in a position to properly deal with all the new um, regulations and all the new obligations that are being imposed upon them. And one of them stands out, and I will come back to that, uh, which is really the fundament and the basis of e-commerce and, and of all trade and development on the Internet. So, 
Am I saying that eBay actually doesn't take counterfeiting seriously? Not at all. We take it extremely seriously. Um, we have uh, put in place a whole range of measures, and some people in this room are uh, engaged in talks with us, bilaterally and, and in other frameworks, uh, and they know they are aware of all the preventive, proactive, and reactive measures that we've put in place to fight counterfeiting. Also of all the information that we make available to our users. And there's one very, very simple reason, and I think all serious players on the internet, all e-commerce players have that very same reason. If you go to a site, and it's all based on trust, I'll come back to trust as well, it's all based on trust. If you go to a site and you buy something, and what you receive is not what you expected to receive, then we know that in 80% of all cases, you will not only never ever go back to that site again, but you will tell your family and your friends that you had a very bad experience. So, not only you, but the whole ink spot effect will be that many, many people will not turn to that site uh, for uh, their buying experience, for, for purchasing goods. So we have a major interest, as a brand owner, as a protector of, of brands as well, to keep our site as clean as possible. Um, whilst acknowledging, and everybody I think in their right mind will do so, that zero counterfeiting is impossible. So we fight it to the absolute minimum possible and um, on the statistical side, and we have very easy statistics since we're an online company, I can tell you that only 0.2% or even less of all the listings on eBay uh, are in any way suspicious through our own filtering uh, mechanisms or through the uh, notice, notices that we've received from both rights owners and uh, consumers and users of eBay. So a very, very small part of what is on our site may be suspect of being counterfeit. Um, why is that, I would say, very laudable result? Uh, why ha and how have we achieved that? Through all our measures, and you will see that most of the measures we take actually go way beyond our legal requirements. They go beyond the requirements that we have through case law. And why are we in a position uh, to do that? And why are we actually doing it? Well, that is simply put, thanks to the European Union regime on host liability that is laid down in the e-commerce directive and in the enforcement directive. So it's thanks to the acquis communautaire. And that, for me, is really the pivotal part of ACTA. It is thanks to this regime, very balanced, that has been very carefully negotiated about 10 years ago, that is now laid down in the e-commerce and the enforcement directive. I'm not talking about IPRED 2, but IPRED 1. Um, it's thanks to that that we as internet players feel very comfortable not only to have a notice and takedown system, but to go the extra mile in keeping our site clean. And a recent case uh, that our, our, our colleagues at, at Google encountered in, in Italy, uh, where some of, of their managers have been uh, sentenced to jail, shows that if there is a wrong interpretation, or there may be a wrong interpretation, because there again we're still guessing what the judge is, judge is based its decision on, but if there is any interpretation or judgment that seems to undermine this host liability exemption that we have under the e-commerce directive, you come into a situation where, as an internet company, you will be forced to edit and control every single piece of information that is put on your site. And I can tell you that is humanly, commercially, economically, and technically totally impossible. Fine. As I said, we're big. We're 14 and a half thousand people. We can have massive departments and we can put hundreds of people doing that. What about newcomers? What about small players? What about if they make a mistake? How many lawyers, how many fees will they have to allocate to defend their cases? What will this do? This will completely stifle innovation and development of the digital single market in the EU. So, that is where we, we come to the point of ACTA and the digital agenda. And again, I'll give you a small figure to, to show you how important it is uh, that the EU goes for this development of their new economy and doesn't hold on to uh, last century's uh, economy and tries to implement rules that are actually linked to that old economy. 
Since the uh, economic crisis started about one and a half year ago, 70,000 new small and medium-sized businesses have opened on eBay in the EU. 70,000 SMEs, a lot of people that were laid off, didn't have a job anymore, they found something to do, they developed a small business, and with minimum investment, they uh, were able to, to launch their trade on eBay. That is what the digital single market is about. And they can do that in a trusted environment, because we create the trusted environment. And I come back to my old, old point, we do that, as I said before, because we have an acquis communautaire that gives us the comfort and the context within doing it. And now back to ACTA, because, um, and trust. Um, we've heard, trust us, we will not agree, we will not propose anything that runs counter to what the acquis communautaire is. For us, as the EU, our mandate is you negotiate on the basis of the acquis, not one inch further than the acquis. And I fully trust the Commission in that. We also trusted the Commission uh, when they negotiated the uh, free trade agreement with Korea. And unfortunately, things happen, in particular at the end of a trade negotiation, at the very, very last moment, not throughout, and that's why I'm actually not particularly... All those negotiations, a little clause crept into the uh, Korean FTA, which suddenly made the host liability exemption that we know in our e-commerce directive subject to a condition that was taken out of context, out of the preamble of the e-commerce directive. Now, it was in the preamble of the e-commerce directive because that's where it belonged. And it was related to very specific limited number of activities on internet, <coughs> caching. You suddenly find subject to a condition that was taken out of context out of the preamble of the e-commerce directive. Now, it was in the preamble of the e-commerce directive because that's where it belonged, and it was related to very specific limited number of activities on internet, <coughs> caching. You suddenly find that criterion in the body of the text in a clause that relates to host liability. And suddenly, you can say, well, we have lived up to the acquis, but the acquis has been put in such a way in the Korea FTA that it gets a whole different meaning, and it, it substantially limits uh, the way that the host liability exemption uh, can be interpreted. That's the danger of these uh, trade agreements. Um, and, and I would actually, when I come to the role of the Parliament in this, on the basis of the resolution, and taking aside any, you know, uh, wise uh, or, or witty uh, reference to, to possible uh, inconsistencies. I think there's one thing is very, very clear and consistent in the uh, European Mar Parliament's resolution. First of all, the text has to come on the table, as it is for everybody to see, to read, to understand, and to have an input into the process. That is crystal clear, and we fully support that as eBay. I only need two more minutes. Um, and I... I was impressed, uh, I think it was last year, when uh, Amendment 138 to the telecom package was voted in, in, in this House with way over 500 votes. I'm even more impressed with this resolution, which got 633 votes, which, according to my calculations, is 86% of all MEPs supported this resolution. And then I come back to trust. With such a clear message, from the European Parliament with the Lisbon Treaty and with all the clear commitments that Luc de Vigne on behalf of the Commission has been making in this room, in the, in the stakeholder meetings, etc. We trust as eBay that when that final text comes to the table that there will be nothing in there that Luc has said us, uh, would not be in there and that the parliamentarians, 633 of them, or a large majority of that, will not accept the text if it does contain, by accident, anything that goes beyond the acquis communautaire, or, or that through the back door, more or less reinterprets the acquis communautaire, because that is where the danger is. That's where the battle will become really subtle, where uh, the legal committees and other experts will have to advise MEPs and other players here, because the danger lies 
in very, very nasty little details that look innocent on the outside, but actually through the composition of the clauses and the text may have a devastating effect to the extent that we as internet players will have to become editors of all the material on our sites and that we may as well close down shop. And the bad thing is that we will close shop in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, in Canada, but not in Russia, not in China, not in Indonesia, uh, in Thailand, and the list goes on and on and on. Is that really what we want? Is that really what the digital agenda is all about? I don't think so. So we trust that the Commission will do the right thing, and through the resolution that has really given us so much hope and, 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 and so, again, trust in the wisdom uh, of all the people involved in the decision-making process, that if ever there comes a text out of that negotiation process, it's just a reflection of what is the acquis communautaire in the EU, and that gives the digital agenda, that gives e-commerce, and that gives new and innovative players in Europe a chance to thrive whilst killing what really is the problem, pure counterfeiting, pure piracy, fake, illegal, non-authorized goods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. It's also once in a while nice to hear that actually somebody does trust us. Um, Without further delay, we would uh, continue with Malcolm Hutty, president of Euro ISPA, and then have a combined question answer round after that, except there's anyone who urgently has a question directly addressed uh, towards uh, Mr. Krafczyk. That doesn't seem to be the case, so we have a chance of gaining time. Please, Malcolm, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, my name is Malcolm Hutty. I'm the president of EuroISPA, which is the Europe's trade association for internet service providers, representing the interests of more than 1,800 internet service providers in Europe um, and internet businesses generally. And I'm here because I believe that in, with the information society becoming an ever more important part of people's lives, placing liability on the internet in intermediaries for what end users do is a serious attack on their fundamental rights. And because I'm concerned that maybe, just maybe, ACTA could become one of the many routes that some stakeholders are using to seek to achieve that. So is there a real threat? Now, Monsieur Devine has said that he doesn't want to talk about the details of leaked text. And I think that's helpful because none of it's agreed until it's all agreed anyway. But it's, so I'm going to try and speak instead about the generalities, about the broad principles, what we think is important to respect when you're agreeing this text, rather than about the micro detail. But at the same time, it won't be entirely possible when I give this bit presentation to avoid everything that's come up as a result of the leaks. It's clear that the leaks have shown that some proposals to limit the protection of internet intermediaries have been on the agenda, and so it's important to discuss whether or not that sort of thing should be allowed to go through. And I, the secrecy of the negotiations leaves the disposition of the parties somewhat unclear. We've heard some pretty solid assurances from Mr. Devine today, but until we see the final text, until we see it, even in a leaked text that says EU reservation on this clause, we have to worry that maybe some things are open to trade. So let's instead look at what we would like to see, or rather what we would like to avoid seeing in the, in the text. I should say a little about the position of internet service providers that I represent in society. We're service providers. We provide an important service to society. We're also commercial entities. That means we do it on a commercial basis. That means we can only do it, provided it continues to be commercially viable. We're also innocent intermediaries. We're not the people that the copyright holders making complaints are complaining about. We're not actually infringing people's copyrights. That's end users. And we have social responsibilities to all of you to comply with legal requirements, to cooperate with law enforcement, and to ensure some respect for your legal rights and fundamental rights as customers. And we know 
that there is a community out there that has been lobbying very hard for ever stricter copyright enforcement measures that are being contemplated in some countries and regions around the world at the moment. And we know that some of those lobby groups would like nothing more than to insert some of those measures into ACTA or anywhere else that they can get a purchase. We've talked about three strikes, graduated responses regimes, to, um, leading to the suspension of internet access capability. But there's also internet network monitoring, internet address blocking, internet bandwidth filtering, network traffic filtering. All these things are proposed by certain stakeholders as measures that they would like to see to restrict the amount of copyright infringement that happens on the internet. Now I see Monsieur Devine frowning, and I quite agree. There's no mention of any of those apart from free strikes, no mention at all in ACTA. Nobody's there's no mention of that in ACTA, but we do know that these policies are pursued by some people. But what it does say in the leaked text is that the protection from liability for third parties for internet intermediaries such as ISPs could be made to be conditioned upon, that's subject to, the ISPs taking certain measures, so-called reasonable policies, to protect intellectual property rights. Now when we talk about it's suggested that ISPs might engage in a three strikes regime, this isn't just a mere suggestion on its own. What's being suggested is that unless the ISPs do something, maybe one of these things, it's not mentioned, it's not listed, but maybe one of these things, the only one that is listed is three strikes. Unless the ISP does one of these things, then they won't benefit from the protection from liability for what end users do. Now, Ms. Devine, you said to Professor Geist that as a law professor, surely you accept that something is either compulsory or it's not. Now, Within internet service providers, most ISP executives are not law professors. They take advice from lawyers, but they're not law professors. And they go to their lawyer and they say, when a new law comes along, like the implementing measures off the back of this. Okay, so this actual thing, it's gone through some point in the future. Do I now have to do three strikes? Ask the lawyer, what does the lawyer say? And the lawyer says, there's nothing in there that says you have to do three strikes. But it does say that if you don't, you might have unlimited liability for the consequences of what the users do in infringing copyright over your network. And what does the ISP executive hear the lawyer say if the lawyer says that? Well, if that's the case, that's effectively commercially mandatory, even if it's not legally mandatory. If you make it impossible to run a network on a commercially viable basis, it might as well be legally, without doing something, it, you might as well make it legally mandatory to do that thing. It amounts to the same thing. So I understand, Monsieur Devine, why you have felt very frustrated with people questioning your word here, because you said very clearly that there's nothing in the treaty that or this, these proposals that requires, that makes it mandatory to do three strikes. I agree. There's nothing in any text that I've seen that says that a member state, the signatory state, has to implement a three strikes regime. But if it, the consequence of this treaty is that member states have to weaken their protection for ISPs from liability, and the only way that the ISP can be assured of gaining that full strength protection from liability is to implement a three strikes regime, then the effect will be the same. Now, and I've, uh, now, as for the question of what's actually in there, there's clearly been text where this has been on the table. It hasn't been proposed by the EU on any text that I've seen. I haven't seen a reservation on it from the EU either. It's clearly something open for discussion. So let's park instead the question of whether or not it's in there, whether or not it's going to be agreed. And instead, let's all agree that it should not be. And I would like to argue for this. Because all those measures on the previous slide, they engage our fundamental rights. They engage the right to a fair trial, to privacy, to freedom of expression, to freedom of association. These rights are not unlimited rights, but the impact on them must be considered. And these kinds of impingements on intermediary liability to make us do any of those things, to make ISPs do any of those things, would put your fundamental rights at risk for a number of reasons, and I'm going to attempt to justify that now. Firstly, ISPs have little capacity 
to mount any kind of defence on your behalf. They've got limited procedural recourse to do so either. They don't have the commercial incentive to do so. And, by the way, these things are also undermining the ISP's rights themselves. So let's look at it. When a copyright holder complains that copyright has been infringed by an end user and says that the ISP must do something about it, whatever that measure might be, the accused, the internet user, has got a variety of defences that they could make. They could say, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. They could say, it's my copyright. Photographers and academics often have um, come to ISPs and complain about each other and say that that plagiarised thesis or that photo on somebody's website was one I took, not, not him. Please take it down. The ISP's got no way of telling who's right there. We've got, currently got a legal case. I've probably shown comments in public about legal cases that are ongoing. But there's a well-publicised public, legal case going on at the moment between um, Google on the one hand um, and a range of copyright holders, um, particularly network television companies in, in the United States. Um, and that's about um, copyright in YouTube clips. Now, part of the evidence there is that clearly the material in many of these YouTube chip clips was copyright, but it turns out that the, for many of those clips, the um, television companies were uploading them to YouTube themselves and were trying to hide that they were doing so to maintain the authenticity, and they found it almost impossible to distinguish themselves between the clips that they had uploaded through their own marketing departments and other clips that other people would upload, uh, or ordinary users had actually uploaded. So you see the difficulty for an ISP or for a hosting provider or any kind of online business in adjudicating whether or not a copyright complaint is actually valid. We've got no practical ability to judge those claims or to defend them in the face of a complaint. If you make a, say, look, I've got this defence, how's the ISP to defend that in the face of the complainant? Procedural fairness as well. The customer, not the ISP, needs to mount any defence that their fundamental rights are being infringed. It's not good enough to say, oh, well, the ISP could mount that defence on behalf of its customer. That doesn't necessarily protect the, the end user. The end user has a right to be involved themselves. In some procedural matters, only the end user the, the, um, can mount the defence because they... Um, have particular protections such as legal cost subsidy, legal aid in some countries or whatever, or various forms of legal cost subsidy that would not be available to an ISP. So, yes, of course, as an ISP representative, I believe it's very important that there should be fairness to the intermediary, fairness to the ISP in the rules. But fairness to the ISP <coughs> is not sufficient to ensure fairness to the end user. You must be, um, provide that as well. Um, also, um, commercial conflicts. If you think that maybe the ISP could stand in your shoes and defend your rights, bear in mind that if you're only paying 10 euros a month or something like that for your broadband connection, that doesn't really fund a very st strong legal defence on behalf uh, for your ISP on your behalf. Um, and ISPs may well have comp competing commercial interests, so like seeking to get a relationship with the copyright holders. So it's not good policy to expect and require to rely on the ISPs to defend end users' fundamental rights. The end users must be given fair protection for their rights directly and in their own name. Now, of course, I admit that I'm a lobbyist for the interests of internet service providers. And so I'm naturally concerned that proposals treat ISPs unfairly with regard to their own businesses too. Now, the various measures, whatever the measures are, often take the perspective that the ISP is a gatekeeper for the internet. But that gatekeeper perspective is just a way of complainants transferring costs from their business to the internet service provider. Of course it's easier for complainants to target the ISP rather than going out <laughs> after many thousands of end users of, uh, who uh, they think are infringing, especially when the costs of actually dealing with that complaint are going to land on the ISP, whereas if they targeted the vast numbers of ordinary end users, the costs would lie with the complainant. That doesn't make it fair to the ISP. Account suspension and other measures that are proposed are, are an unfair burden on ISPs, not least because 
if we have to cut people off, we lose the fee that we get every month. But not just that, the whole process of going through it, the legal risks involved, all these things are costs on ISPs that when we haven't actually done anything wrong. Perhaps most important, the technical measures that are proposed in many quarters, whether through ACTA or, or the people lobbying in ACTA or other, other ways, routes, are a strategic threat to the ISP's core business. Now, so ISPs have a variety of business models, but two of them are a basic infrastructure provider that just provides a dumb pipe and a general service access business that might provide something like a consumer content portal and various other services too. Whichever way you cut it, these technical measures giving too much power to the copyright interest to decide what is acceptable online is a strategic threat, either to be able to have an open internet on which the Ebays and Amazons and Googles can build on, or to be able to run your own service delivery process. So these are important fundamental rights, and it, the only way of protecting these fundamental rights is to protect the ISP. And the U European acquis has recognized this. And that's why we have the e-commerce directive protecting, and I'm not going to go through all the legal detail, we don't have time, but the, there is strong and solid protection for the ISPs in the e-commerce directive that is not conditioned upon us taking action against the customers. It's conditioned upon whether or not we are actually just an intermediary. The Yaki has also provided protection for citizens, saying that any limit that member states can impose <coughs> must be appropriate and proportionate and must have a right to um, the presumption of innocence and a prior in, an impartial procedure. And that was the Amendment 138, the now the Amendment 13A of the Framework Directive that went through, provides that in the European Acquis. So, Monsieur Levine, when you say that you will protect the European Acquis, I take that to mean, and I look forward to seeing in further leaks, reservations on this, to on this topic, because I take that to mean that none of this will be compromised. I take that to mean that there must be no requirement for ISPs to implement these things, to implement the measures that I listed before, and also that not only must there be no absolute requirement, but their protection from liability must not be conditioned upon doing any of those things. So, in conclusion, these fundamental rights long guaranteed to citizens and businesses can easily become essentially unenforceable in the information society and without effect in the digital environment unless you give interme intermediaries strong legal protection. So our goals in EURISPA for the treaty negotiations certainly would be to see the full transparency and full stakeholder consultation, not just the, um, a small community such as are being consulted at least by some governments, not necessarily by the EU but also strong adherence to the community acquis. And that means that actor I would like to see being limited to, counterfeiting, uh, to combating counterfeit goods. And failing that, we must fully respect the rights of internet intermediaries in a digital environment if we are to see our own rights as citizens pr um, protected. We must avoid making ISPs the copyright police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do I see? Please. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Schreiber and I'm working for the European Crop Protection Industry. That means the producers of agricultural chemicals. And I dare to turn away from internet and electronic commerce. Because our industry is very much concerned by counterfeit increasing in tremendous amounts. Uh, I got not only confused by the speakers, I got also a bit inspired to ask a political and a business question. The hot issue, one of the hot issues of the debate seemed to be, yes, ACTA should not go beyond the acquis communautaire. I say, why not? If provisions put in ACTA, which would really pursue the objective of ACTA to fight counterfeit and piracy, then please go beyond the acquis for three reasons. A, and please answer that, A, I know in the negotiations between the European Union and third countries on FTAs, we impose all the time on third countries to change their laws, happily for many industries and with success, because we want them to 
adopt our rules because we think they're wonderful, and in many <coughs> cases they are. B, I'm sure the first time we will see the draft text of ACTA, the Commission will consult all kinds of stakeholders. So there's still a long consultation process. And C, we have a so-called ratification process where people or institutions like the European Parliament can still intervene and so on and so on. So that's the political question. Why not going beyond the acquis? The business question, I like Mr. Krafcik's comment. Yes, in the e-commerce directive, we have host liability. And for, unfortunately, if I compare that to conventional business, trade in conventional products, we don't have that because we do not yet have liability for transport companies. And that is a real big issue for our sector and many other sectors. Maybe ACTA can look at that, maybe it is already in the text, I don't know, but we would be delighted to see any progress on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for extending the wish list. Um, <laughs> please, I believe there has been a question uh, dedicated to you. Why not go beyond the Aki community here? I want to come out of this place alive. <laughs> no, simply because uh, legislation is made uh, in the European context by institutions, uh, Council and now Parliament on trade matters, on proposal by the Commission. And it is not uh, uh, through uh, <laughs> international negotiations that you can short circuit all that. But I, I hear what you say. I know that your industry is facing difficulties since uh, I deal with that uh, through a number of uh, intellectual property negotiations with uh, third countries who are often the source of, uh, of these dangerous uh, counterfeit. Uh, so I, I understand the problem, but I'm afraid I will not go <laughs> nearly as far as you, as you suggest uh, on this. Um, and also, one correction, we don't impose things in FTAs, we propose. These are agreements between sovereign states. Um, perhaps uh, can I say one word to Mr. Uh, Hutti? Uh, and Hutti? Yeah. Yes, pronunciation. Um, and I, I'll be extremely consensual and boringly consensual because I agree with everything you say. Your wish list that we don't go beyond the Aki is not a problem at all for me. Um, I will not go through details, but uh, the important topics, uh, right of privacy, uh, the current system of conditional liability, uh, to put it technically uh, correct, um, uh, in, the, in the European law, it's, it's not a problem at all. This is exactly what we're going to go. Once more, yes, we will not accept the three-strike rule, and nobody has proposed a compulsory three-strike rule, um, if, that, if that can be more, more, more clearly. Um, you mentioned we put a reservation, we should put a reservation proposal. I mean, uh, it goes without saying we will not accept uh, any proposal going beyond that. Uh, I mean, act of negotiation doesn't work by reservation system, so we don't need to do that, but we simply say that we don't accept uh, uh, any, any three strike rule compulsory, and that's it. One correction. May I ask clarity? Uh, I thought we'd move beyond that, because I accepted that you weren't proposing yes, to impose a three-strike rule. We will not rule. accept it neither. We you won't, accept, you it won't neither. accept it right. being made a, um, acceptable, a requirement to condition the li protection from liability. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. That's exactly that, okay. yes. We will not accept it as a condition to benefit from the safe harbor that you impose a three-strike rule policy. Is I mean, more clear than that, I cannot be. Um, and so I, I will disagree though with you to say that when something is not legally mandatory, it can be commercially mandatory. I mean, this is not how we operate. This is a treaty. There are obligations or no obligations. Uh, but again, we will... We will, uh, we will make sure that uh, there is no such uh, condition, because simply there is no such condition in Europe. Some countries have put that as a condition, but that's not a European-wide system. So at the same time, it's a lot in certain countries, but it's not the rule of the European Union which we will defend. Thank you. All right. Now I have three speakers, and uh, I would need indications for further speakers. Otherwise, for this round, I would close the list afterwards. Good. If, uh, Stavros Lamanidis, Joe McNamee, and our colleague, uh, Mr. Engstrom. Thank you, Alexander. I'm Stavros Lamanidis. I'm a member of the European Parliament. Um, the, um, for Mr. Devine, uh, two or three questions. Uh, I'm doing this in English, which you understand, because I see you're putting on the... Uh, okay. Okay, fair enough. The, uh, 
the commercial scale issue, um, as I listened to you speak about it, uh, I got a little concerned. I understand that we do not have a clear definition, but aren't you concerned in these negotiations uh, that uh, by lacking a definition, uh, I may fly from an airport in Paris, where no one considers what I have in Paris to be a problem, but nevertheless be potentially arrested in New York because under their law, what I am carrying with me is commercially unacceptable. And shouldn't therefore, uh, you be, uh, shouldn't you be a little more concerned about trying to reach uh, an outlines of a definition that would make um, uh, people around a little more comfortable, uh, given the fact that you probably would never be able to have something that is, uh, you know, specific to the last detail. Now, have you given, second question for Ms. Devine, have you given any documents out to the ITRA committee on the EU's position in these negotiations? Because no matter what the confidentiality agreement you have among you behind those closed doors may say, clearly it doesn't limit your right to tell us in every detail the exact position that the EU is proposing for each one of these particular now, if you haven't done it, I'd be more than grateful to you if you could have a document for members of parliament in which for every one of these issues you list what the EU is proposing uh, in these negotiations without revealing necessarily what other countries may be proposing if that would upset them. Um, I am not sure I understand your answer to Mr. Hutti. I think he, I, I mean, I, I do understand it, but I'm a little concerned because what he raised as an issue uh, sounded rather reasonable. If there's a general language in the final agreement that says that ISPs uh, would be uh, subject to immunity from persecution unless, uh, if they take uh tens of thousands of people, and I'm very proud of what I'm doing at eBay, uh, but if his, what he's doing were to be the standard uh, for how one interprets then the, the agreement's provisions, and then wouldn't be the case that a number of other ISPs failing that standard uh, would miss liability. And therefore, and that is the, I think, very interesting point that you made, and I perfectly well understood the legal versus commercial implication. Couldn't it be uh, that a number of lawyers around Europe would simply advise their ISPs, look, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but do what eBay is doing if you want to feel safe about things, or do three strikes because the agreement doesn't say anything, but if you want my legal advice, and I don't want to be fired by you afterwards for giving you the wrong one, uh, you know, just do as much as you can to limit people's fundamental rights on the internet, I would say, but that's a big discussion. Now, uh, Mr. Krasny, I'm, I'm closing, Alexander. Um, the, uh, I took your pun at the beginning about, about poor Mr. Devine having to, uh, to engage in this painful democratic process of explaining things to people. Uh, but in fact, I assure you, it's a very, very wise thing that he's doing. And maybe one might argue it took him too long. Uh, because in the end of the day, this parliament will have to approve the agreement. And even if it is one that pleases you, uh, it will not pass the parliament's muster unless it is very well explained. And that means as well the process of getting there. In fact, I would advise and encourage Mr. Devine to look at to the players in this parliament and uh, involve them in these negotiations. Mr. Kreisler, how many times have you spoken with Mr. Devine, by the way, about this issue? I'm guessing a number of times. Am I wrong? It's an issue that is burning your company. You have met with him, presumably? Yes. On ACTA, I'm talking about. You announced you would come to your end because we have two more speakers yes. in no, time. Just, I, I'm assuming that you've had a number of contacts at any rate. More than the two contacts that you have had with the ITRA committee. Uh, what, what, what I hope we manage to, to achieve here is an understanding that engaging this parliament uh, in this effort is not a luxury. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not something that should come as a second thought after all the companies have come and talked to you, Mr. Devine, but it should be, uh, it should be uh, your first concern. Uh, finally, Mr. Hadi, actual knowledge, you said, exists already in the law today, that that is under the key, the, uh, the test for you to be potentially held liable. 
if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Uh, for hosting providers, but not for mere conduit. That's if, going into, uh, I, I said I wouldn't go said, into the okay, legal detail, but there is, a dis there is a distinction between the position of hosting well, hold on, providers and mere conduit. let me just finish the conduit. question and can answer it. Now, I understand this, but how does this jive with all the examples you gave before about people coming and telling you that, well, this is, you know, this is a violation of my copyright, and you claiming, well, I could not judge this, but then, if they informed you in theory, you have actual knowledge. So I'm trying to understand if you're happy with actual knowledge as exists today in the law, how this uh, could possibly um, satisfy all the examples you gave before that appear to want to exonerate you from liability, even if in cases in which you do have actual knowledge. Thank you. I haven't used the hammer today yet. I was tempted. Um, now, shortly, please, Mr. McNamee, and then uh, Mr. Angstrom. I can be fairly short. Uh, Mr. Kravchik raised a very interesting and important point about Korea. The uh, liability provisions of the e-commerce directive were copied and pasted into the Korea agreement with the proviso that it only covers intermediaries that are in no way involved in the information that they um, are uh, communicating, which would raise serious questions about the protections that eBay, for example, have become used to under the e-commerce directive. Um, and he said that he hopes that the same thing won't happen again in, uh, in ACTA. Does the Commission recognize that it uh, altered the uh, meaning of the key in Korea, uh, in the Korea FTA? Because if we don't recognize the mistake that was made in Korea, we're likely to repeat it in ACTA. Uh, I'm Christian Engstrom. I'm a me mem member of this parliament for the Pirate Party. Uh, I've got a ve very short, short question for, for Mr. Devine. Uh, the resolution that was, was taken by the parliament by 633 votes for 13 against. Uh, calls on the Commission to continue the negotiations on ACTA, but to limit them to counterfeiting. What, what prevents you from simply following this resolution? Thank you very much. I believe there have been questions directed to Mr. Devinia, Mr. Kraftig, and Mr. Hatti. Um, if you could be so kind also to answer as short as possible, or as it makes sense. because mine are really going to be short. Um, first of all, I should underline whatever I've said does in no way mean that I think this House should not be consulted. I hope that the conclusion of my um, what I said today is very clear. I think this House should very intensively be consulted uh, on ACTA by the Commission, so let there be no doubt about that. Um, and that's what I also meant with trust. I trust that, that this Parliament uh, will look very critically uh, at ACTA and will work with the Commission and vice versa to make sure that it does not go anywhere near uh, beyond the acquis communautaire. As to the number of meetings that I have had with uh, Luc de Vigne, again what my introduction may have suggested related to my former uh, activity in, before I worked for eBay. Um, ever since I worked for eBay I've met with Luc once as part of a delegation from our trade association uh, EDIMA uh, and we indeed raised uh, generally, and Edema includes Amazon and Google and Orange and Yahoo and many, many other players, and, and we indeed raised our, our concerns about ACTA and our priorities, and they are more or less exactly the same as the ones that I, I raised today. Um, so just to get the record straight on that. Thank you. Um, first, the questions uh, by Mr. Lambindis. Um, commercial scale not defined, is there a risk of diverging interpretation throughout different countries? Of course, the answer is yes. Uh, but then, um, would this mean that we should start uh, defining commercial scale? First of all, as guardian of the treaty, it's impossible to do, do, do so because I would go beyond what is the interpretation, what, what is the current legislation. If I start giving one interpretation and defend one interpretation of a commercial scale, I am going beyond what the European legislator has done. 
because it has decided not to define it. And so on which right, on which ground could I commission favor one type of interpretation since there are diverging interpretations and try to make my interpretation the interpretation of the actor parties? So you are right on the on, if you want, uh, the existing risk of diverging interpretation, although this has to be left to judges and not just authorities, it's, it's, it's because it's criminal sanction, so it's, it's judge eventually. And also, um, we have that already today. ACTA will not change anything to that because it is the criteria, the commercial scale, the undefined criteria of commercial scale is the criteria for criminal enforcement throughout the 153 WTO members today. So ACTA is not new. Uh, second question, uh, did we speak to INTA or did we, did we give the documents to INTA? Yes, we did, sir. Absolutely, we did. And I can even say that some of these documents were leaked. So, yes, we did. Um, as to the uh, um, question on, uh, yes, uh, when Stefan has started, to, has started to, 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 uh, to answer that, we do not have a privileged channel for companies uh, over other uh, and either citizens or let alone, of course, MEPs, not at all. It is not at all the case. We have organized the three stakeholders meeting in 2008, 9, 10. The first one, there were 20 people present. I mean, this is not our fault. Um, one can always say we should make more efforts than advertising it, etc. But uh, as to the European Parliament, they, through the Inter Committee, they've been, they've been informed in detail of the text since the beginning, actually even before the negotiation started. So this was pre-Lisbon. It was definitely going beyond, if you want, the strictly legal treaty obligation of the Commission. It was a, a choice of the, of the Commission to do so because the Commission believed it was important to inform the Parliament, even if that didn't have to, to do it, strictly legally speaking. But, and we will certainly continue doing it and, uh, and answer any, any questions one might have. Um, Mr. McNamee uh, would like me to recognize there's been a mistake in the Korea FTA. I do not agree with him. Um, I don't think it's going beyond our key. We can have a technical debate if you want on exactly the wording, uh, we, including with my colleagues uh, who have uh, either drafted the European law or negotiated the FTA provision, but I don't agree with you. Um, uh, Mr. Engstrom has mentioned, has made a reference to the European Parliament resolution, but he said, and I don't think it's quite what the resolution says, that the, com that the resolution prohibits the Commission to speak of other things and counterfeiting. This is not my reading of resolution. The resolution says on paragraph 8 that calls on the Commission to continue the negotiations on ACTA in order to improve the effectiveness of, effectiveness, pardon, of the IP enforcement system against counterfeiting. And then the next paragraph says, urges the Commission to ensure that the enforcement of ACTA provisions, especially those on copyright enforcement procedures in the digital environment, are fully in line with the acquis communautaire. We fully agree with that, but by definition, if it is mentioned that there should be provisions on copyright enforcement procedures, it means that we have to cover all uh, the intellectual property rights, which is also our obligation, because our European acquis goes, um, is comprehensive for all IP rights, and we consider all IP rights to be equal. Thank you. Can I, I was referring to, to Article 9, which, where it says, I'm, re, I'm reading from, from the <laughs> consolidated version now, calls on the Commission to continue the negotiations on ACTA and limit them to the existing European IPR enforcement system against counterfeiting. Do you find anything unclear in that sentence? And I, I simply can't understand what the problem is. Limit it to the IPR enforcement on counterfeiting. And my question was, why, why is the, you and the Commission not prepared to do that? Because the Commission has to read the whole resolution and to abide by it, and not just one paragraph. And the other paragraphs mention copyright. We will not engage now in a dialogue on interpretation how to read resolutions. Um, there has been a question put forward to you, so um, welcome. then that, I suppose, can be answered. And how you answer, of course, I cannot tell you, but please limit it a little bit because we still have one presentation and we're a little bit bound. I, as I say, I'm not a law professor, so I don't really understand the full details of that. I can only suppose that Monsieur Devine is suggesting that were it to be limited to just 
counterfeiting, somehow that would be incompatible with the um, a key on copyright, which doesn't seem to make any sense to me. But as I said, I'm not a law professor, so I don't quite understand um, his answer to that. Um, the uh, question that was addressed to me was actually to suggest that maybe the um, European key on internet and intermediaries is inadequate that maybe the import of what I was saying on protecting fundamental rights meant that the European key ought to give further protection to internet intermediaries because the key has that protection evaporates in the case of hosting providers when they become have actual knowledge of the infringement the European key on the protection of internet intermediaries under the e-commerce directive attempts to define the distinction, draw the distinction as to who is protected, not based upon any kind of reasonable steps or best efforts or any other kind of thing to prevent copyright infringement or, any other, or anything else. The European Acquis on the Protection of Internet Intermediaries under the e-commerce directive can, um, defines that protection according to whether or not you are an internet intermediary or not. And it attempts to provide a, def a definition of what's the, what is an internet intermediary and when you fall outside that definition. So it says in the definition of mere conduits that if it's just passing over your network, saying you're a mere conduit, but if you're actually starting that communication, you're initiating the communication, then you're more than just a mere conduit. And in the case of hosting providers, it says that if, you've actually, if you actually know what's going on, then you're not just merely hosting it as an unwitting host, you're actually, um, in, um, according to its definition, um, a primary publisher. And that's the balance that the Aki tries, uh, tries to make. Now, it's true, I do accept criticism in that the actual knowledge test in hosting provision is the most difficult part of the Aki in this respect. There are clearly times when it is right that somebody who has actual knowledge of certain kinds really has gone beyond the bounds of being a hosting provider and should be subject to liability. But there are also times when you, you are simply a, a pure hosting provider and you're presented with a complaint that you don't know how to judge. So maybe at some time in the future, this would be the area that I would, would indeed like to look at again. But it is a careful balance because I think the attempt in the Aki to try and distinguish between what is a host, uh, an intermediary and what is going beyond being an intermediary is the right thing to try to do. Now, I don't think, however, that the right place to try and extend to have that conversation and maybe extend that a key is through an international agreement outside the purview um, of the uh, ordinary legislative process. I, I would, it would be hypocritical of me to say that just because maybe I might think that this could be um, added to in the future, it would now I'd like to do that through ACTA. That would be hypo hypocrisy, and I won't fall into that trap. Thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> after the academics, the civil servants, business, and service provider have spoken, like in real life, the legal service comes and wraps it all up again. What actually is the truth and how is Parliament in these international agreements involved and what is our role? And I'm very, very happy that we have Angelina Goss with us, uh, who basically is representing the EP's legal service, and by that, the brain, once in a while, of this house. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation, Mr. Alvaro. I'll try to be brief because we are out of time. Uh, as I will speak about the role and rights of the European Parliament in relation to international agreements, I will focus very much on the procedure. So how is the procedure for conclusion of the agreements and where the Parliament steps in and with what rights. But uh, before that, I would like to make some uh, preliminary remarks in relation to the competence of the EU to conclude international agreements. Uh, which is now under the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, a principle enshrined in Article 212 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which provides that the European Union may conclude international agreements with third countries or with international organizations, and those agreements will be binding on the Union and the Member States. Now, the European Union can conclude the agreements either alone or with the Member States in which case we speak then 
about mixed agreements. It was already mentioned earlier that if you have an agreement where you have criminal sanctions, then this is not a competence of the European Union, so that's why for this part of the agreement it is being negotiated by the member states represented by the presidency. So the choice whether you have one agreement or not depends really very much on the scope, whether it falls under the EU competence or covers elements of member states' competence. Now going to the procedure, it is um, outlined in detail in Article 212 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And uh, I will focus on two main changes that were brought about by the Lisbon Treaty. The first is that now the consent of the Parliament is for conclusion of agreement is the rule rather than the exception, as was before. And the second concerns the specific provision of paragraph 10 of Article 218, which requires that the Parliament is immediately and fully informed at all stages of the procedure. I will go through the procedure and then look at what these two elements mean in practice for the Parliament's involvement in the negotiations, for the Parliament's influence on the contents of the agreement, and with regard to the provisional application. Starting with, with the procedure, because there were several questions how exactly it, uh, it works in practice. Uh, normally the Commission is the one who initiates the procedure and um, they prepare the draft negotiating directives and uh, which are sent then to the Council. And we had a recent example a couple of weeks ago, for example, when the draft negotiating directives on the accession of the EU to the European Convention of Human Rights were adopted by the Commission and then presented to the Council. This, of course, is just the beginning of the procedure and the Council has to take then um, a decision uh, with which uh, uh, decides three issues. First, um, authorizes the opening of the negotiations and issues the negotiating directives, or what we also call the negotiating mandate. Then nominates the union negotiator, which in most cases is the commission, but if you have, for example, member states involved, it, it nominates the head of the union delegation. Uh, and then it also may designate a special committee in consultation with which the negotiations are conducted. Now, after uh, having all these guidelines and the framework provided by the Council, the Commission, uh, in most cases, starts the negotiations and consults with the respective special committee if such has been appointed. At the end of the negotiations, the Commission initials and the third country agree on a text and they um, initial it. So what is important to note is that the initialing just signifies that there is an agreement on a text and the negotiations have stopped at this point in time. This text is not legally binding yet. After the text is initialed, the Commission sends two proposals for Council decisions back to the Council. With the first, it's a proposal for signature or and possibly for provisional application, if such an application is considered necessary. And the second is the proposal for the conclusion of the agreement. Now, at this point, the Council adopts the decision authorizing the signature. And if uh, there, there was a proposal from the Commission on provisional application, also authorizes the provisional application. And only at this point in time, the Council then requests the Parliament consent on the agreement before it is concluded. So where the consent is required, if the Parliament gives its consent, then the Council concludes the agreement. If Parliament refuses its consent, that the agreement cannot be concluded. And in case when there was, it was provisionally applied, then the provisional application needs to be terminated which already has been tasted in the case of uh, SWIFT. And at the very end, after the Parliament has given its consent, the Council adopts the decision concluding the agreement. 
Now here there is a small uh, detail in relation to the mixed agreements because in cases where you have a mixed agreement, you will also need to have the member states ratify the agreement. So the conclusion at the level of the EU comes only after the ratification at the national level has been completed. Now, to go back to the role of the Parliament, as you have seen, the Parliament uh, decides if role comes only at the very end, when the agreement has been negotiated and it has been signed. But through Article 218.6, now it's clear that the consent is required for all agreements in the field of which ordinary legislative procedure applies internally which changes a lot the situation in relation to the pre-Lisbon. Because now, of course, the Commission knows even before they propose the draft negotiating directives whether they will need the Parliament consent or not, and which then requires the full, and, um, full information of the Parliament of all stages of the agreement. This is why the second main change brought about the Treaty of Lisbon is so important, because it sort of transforms uh, the, the consequence of the Parliament's consent into a right to be involved during the negotiations, or at the very minimum, to be informed. So I will read again that what Article 218.10 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union provides, it is that the Parliament shall be immediately and fully informed at all stages of the procedure. So what does it mean in practice? It means that at the very beginning the Parliament has to be informed about the recommendations submitted to the Council. So what are the draft negotiating directives? What is the authorization to negotiate? What are the final negotiating directives adopted by the Council? Should receive information of the, one, of the same information that is provided to the special committee uh, with which the Commission consults during the negotiations. And this, of course, can include the draft text, the agreed text, and finally the initial text once the agreement is initialed. And, of course, be informed whether the Commission at the end intends to propose provisional application or not. I will return a bit um, later to the provisional application. But it's important to stress that it is not just providing documents. It includes also information about how the negotiations are conducted, how they are progressing. And this can be ensured in various ways, which have been tested by some committees in the Parliament. It can be with uh, regular exchanges of views with the Commission, for example, and if there is issue of confidentiality, it can be done, of course, in camera. Um, it can include, uh, for example, MEPs having observer status in case of some international conferences, which has been done already uh, at some WTO ministerial meetings. Uh, it can also include um, having MEPs also as an observer at um, the meetings of some relevant special committees. What is important to know here is that since Parliament's consent now is generally required for the conclusion of the agreements, it makes sense for the Commission and also for the Council to involve the Parliament at an early stage. Uh, how exactly this will happen is still a subject to negotiation um, under the framework agreement with uh, the Commission now. But it is especially important that the Parliament has a chance to make its views known at a very early stage, because before the negotiations advance, so that it's clear from the beginning what it considers the most important elements the agreement should or should not include if it is to receive the Parliament's consent at the very end. For example, this could be issues of human rights clauses or environment and social clauses, but it would be beneficial for all institutions and parties to have the Parliament's view clear at the beginning of the procedure, rather than at the end where the Parliament has only the nuclear option of uh, not giving the consent to uh, the agreement. 
having the, the, that's why I said at the beginning that having the consent could create a right and possibility to influence the contents of the agreement because by being informed from the very beginning by uh, stating clearly what is the no-go line at, and what are the essential elements for the parliament at the agreement at a very early stage this allows the parliament to influence the contents of the agreement but also it decreases it's beneficial for the commission and the council because it reduces the risk for the parliament to refuse its consent to give its consent at the very end of the procedure now i'll, I'll go briefly to the provisional application as i mentioned earlier there is a possibility for of this intention before submitting it to the Council, which would of course give the Parliament the time to express its position, whether it has strong reservation or not to the provisional application. Now, as I said, this is the general framework created by the Treaty. And now, how these horizontal issues will be um, agreed upon and how the information flow um, will be organized with the Commission will depend very much on the a new framework agreement on relations between the Parliament and the Commission which is in the process of being negotiating now but the Parliament in its resolution of 9th of February has already indicated two elements that would like to see there so the first is the reinforced association in the uh, negotiating process and uh, the full use of Article 218.10, meaning being fully, immediately and fully informed at all stages of the agreement. And uh, what I also mentioned earlier, the, um, there is also a um, demand for exploring the possibility of including MEPs, rapporteur, uh, rapporteurs or um, uh, chairs of parliamentary committee as observers at uh, various delegations. So, to sum up at the end, as I said, the possibility of the Parliament to influence the conduct of, the, of international agreements arises mainly from the fact that the Parliament has to give ultimately its consent to the agreement. And to ensure that such a consent is given, it is indispensable that, it is, uh, that, that the Parliament be fully informed throughout the procedure. Thanks a lot. Okay, everybody, this concludes a very long uh, but very, very interesting afternoon, and I want to thank you for your uh, patience and uh, engaging. I also wanted to thank the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe for their support in organizing this seminar, which is very important, as well as uh, Alexander and his office and my own staff for organizing, getting you all here, communicating with you, and putting all the work into bringing us together this afternoon. And of course, I want to thank the panel very much. Uh, Michael Geist, who came all the way from Canada to give us a very detailed uh, outline of his findings on the uh, leaked ACTA proposals and who's en route to New Zealand and will hopefully keep us updated of what he finds there. Uh, Luc de Vigne for placing himself in the lion's den, uh, but I truly hope that you will come back because indeed engagement from uh, an early stage and an ongoing engagement is important and we see, I think, from the growing interest uh, that this is only the beginning of, an, of a discussion that is not over yet. Uh, Stefan Kravchik for giving his outline uh, of eBay as a rights holder, uh, a brand that relies on trust uh, and for whom uh, there's a serious interest in uh, not being engaged with trading in counterfeit goods, but also in free access to the internet. Uh, Malcolm Hutti from Europol SPA on all the implications for uh, the SPAs and how he sees uh, uh, ACTA and for the very uh, detailed and, and uh, procedural but very important outline that Angelina Gross uh, just, so just gave. I'm not going to dare uh, speak out the rest of your uh, last name. Thank you very much because it's very important for us all to understand where we are in these stages and to know uh, what legal options we have. So. Um, as you encourage us to stay engaged with you all from various uh, stakeholders, interest groups, NGOs, and organizations, uh, we will make sure 
to represent you and all those people who were not here today in engaging with the European uh, Commission. Uh, we're very interested in, in the process of building trust and uh, we certainly will stand for uh, claiming transparency over relying on leaks and we believe that uh, that's a substantive basis for cooperation in the democratic process which is the key for us. So um, hopefully we can continue to represent Europe's interests together because in the end we're not only facing inter-institutional uh, debates on this but also a negotiation on a global scale of which we may face very different uh, points of view in relation to other countries with their own internal dynamics. So let's strive for that. Uh, I don't want to cut you off from your freedom and the reception that's waiting uh, outside. So a well-deserved drink for everybody. I hope you'll stick around to continue an informal discussion. And thanks again to everybody for being here.